Welcome to the Mad Ones. I'm your just got offered a job to play Burt Kreischer's body double in his next special host, Cam Harless. And with me, as always, is your worked in New Zealand for a couple of years playing a Hobbit body double, hostess, <laughs> Miss Jessica Green. How are you doing? Yeah, that would have been so awesome. Wouldn't it be? I mean, you could have been oh, that little man. guy that pretended to be uh, Elijah Wood. I could have, I could have been Warwick Davis. You could if have I been, had, but you if weren't. I had put just a little more effort in at school, <laughs> I could have been America's top uh, little person actor. But you I could didn't. have, but you didn't. But I didn't. I'm a disappointment I mean, it's, to my family. It's and and all of your fans. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to give up on my dream of being Warwick Davis. So you yeah. know, he just basically better watch out. <laughs> so, uh, before we get started with our guest, I want to let you know that this show is 100% brought to you by our fans and patrons who get to watch this early because they're patrons. And so everyone else gets to watch it on the, at the regular time. You're watching it at the regular your regular time right now and you could have watched it and chatted with us early. So what's wrong with you? Why didn't you do that? So, uh, if you want to do that, uh, go to patreon.com slash the mad ones. We do zoom parties. We do early episodes. I have something else that I'm working on that I'll reveal later that I think is going to be cool, but I'm not there yet. Um, beyond that, hit like subscribe, do all the stuff that you're supposed to do. And if you want I, check out the new shirt, Jessica, do you see this? My new tank top Yeah. with the nice it's really cool green logo. And also look at yeah. this. Oh, matching mug. Yes. Very nice. So very nice. If you want that. We are the mad ones.com slash store, but that's all I have to say for that. Uh, we, I'm so excited about this episode. I, I think I reached out to him in February, so I've been excited to talk to this guy for a while. Uh, but let me go ahead and introduce him. Uh, joining to, joining us tonight is a pliglet. If you don't know what that is, you will soon. He's a man who probably hasn't seen your favorite movie. He once lost his entire life savings to Mother's Day, and every mm -hmm. time he hears a Yo Mama joke, he has to ask which one. He's a comedian, a TikTok star, an escapee of Mormon polygamy, and an innocent exploring the depraved world of heathenry hitherto unseen mr ben brown hey everybody how are you doing uh, uh, that intro made me feel so special and wicked <laughs> it's what i it's what i shoot for yeah crushing it <laughs> so you escaped a mormon polygamist compound i did yes so i uh i grew up on a mormon polygamist compound and i left when i was about 17 okay and uh when i left so the, the community that I grew up in was, was really small. I, I interacted with maybe like 20 or 30 people for most of my, like most of my time between, uh, when I was born and when I, when I left. Uh, and so you can imagine that seeing all these people out here has been a little bit daunting. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was something that I wondered because I, it seems that, cause I made the joke to you. Uh, because I found out I was my wife was watching Sister Wives as I was as I ch had chatted with you. I was mm -hmm. looking through and setting some stuff up, and as I walked past the screen, I hear Cody Brown, and I go, Ben Brown, <laughs> Cody Brown, and I was like, hmm. <laughs> and then I messaged you because I was like, Are you related to the Sister Wives? Yes, and I am. He's my uncle. <laughs> And I, and so I, I, te I texted you and I was like, I was going to say small world, but I mean, it's on TV. So not really. And my second thought was no, but really it's an insular group. So it is a small it's world. A super small world. <laughs> yeah. It's a tiny, <laughs> tiny world in Mormon. That we all, that we all hail from. That led to one question that I have for you, but I do want to kind of get like the whole story in some sense, if we can yeah. after that. Totally. But when you left and you started meeting a bunch of other people, um, one of the things that came to mind was, and it was because of the Brown Brown situation is when you started hearing all these different last names, were you surprised that there were, there were more <laughs> last names than you knew? <laughs> uh, I, I wasn't, um, but I've actually, I've talked to other people, other pliglets who have left who were, um, I think that I had a slightly, I had an idea that there was a bigger world out there. Cause I read okay. a lot as a, as a kid. Um, but I was surprised by how many different, uh, just how different people lived. Yeah. Like the, the range of what was okay was mm -hmm. much wider than I had been raised to believe. And, and at first it was kind of scary and then it was really fun. That's good. That's how, it, how it usually goes. <laughs> <laughs> if you just lean into scary a little bit on the other side of it is a little bit of fun. You get right. to watch Labyrinth. And I get to watch Labyrinth, which I watched for the first time last night. 
Yeah, you really need to be eased into that cod piece. Yes, it's a I'm lot. glad that it. I'm glad that it took me a couple of years to you know out to see. You know, I saw some smaller cod pieces. Um, <laughs> I saw some yoga pants. I was prepared for the right. monstrosity that was uh, David Bowie. I will warn you ahead of time that any of the Shakespearean films that were filmed in the 1960s and 70s are all giant codpiece movies. Like, you really can't get away from it. You could do a codpiece marathon. I could do a really codpiece marathon. That sounds like the worst marathon to do. I think I would rather <laughs> do an actual marathon. <laughs> so the worst marathon to do is the Steven Seagal marathon, which my husband just put me through. And I think I'm considering filing for divorce after that, so... I'm sure that that would have that joke would have landed with other people, but I don't know who Steven Seagal is. Oh, God bless. You know, I, I wonder what it's like to live in a world where you don't know who Steven Seagal is. It must be pretty great, to be honest. It sounds like it must be because he sounds terrible. Yeah, yeah. No, he he's he's the worst human being alive. I'm oh, pretty sure. I, like, I don't even feel like shy about saying that Steven Seagal is probably the worst person alive. But I also like really want you to watch some Steven Seagal movies now, so you can understand where I'm coming from on this. You're you'll have to you'll have to suggest one for me because I that's okay. the thing that I do. So I oh, I will suffer with you. I'm so excited. Please, please pick the worst one. It's got to be it's got to be Fire Down Below. But that if, sounds if, like the worst movie ever. If people are watching this and you have an idea about the a worse Steven Seagal movie than Fire Down Below, please let us know in the chat in the comments. Because if you can think of a worse one, we just got to get him the absolute like bottom of the barrel of Steven Seagal movies. <laughs> Fire so, Down uh, Below sounds like, sounds like a Johnny Cash song gone very wrong. That's a weirdly <laughs> accurate description of Steven Seagal. <laughs> That's so wild. You're a stupid dude, man. I am I, really I am just very tapped into polygamous Jesus and he sometimes reveals <laughs> truth to me. Yeah, he oh, I mean man. he's likely who inflicted Steven Seagal on us. So probably, yes, yeah. to punish right. the to punish the wicked and to test the righteous. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so um are we uh, we're gonna wait for the questions until after, because I, I have like I could rapid fire questions at you about this. So I guess we're gonna let you kind of tell the story of yeah. so getting out yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And to cool. start, tell me, tell me kind of the the frame that you'd like me to to talk through. Well, to start, I I, I assume you were born into polygamy, correct? I was, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is does, does your family have like a long history of it or? Yeah, so the, the the way I would sort of characterize what my family is in is they're they're in what I call the Mormon cult, right? And and by the Mormon cult, what I mean is in in 1830, this dude named Joseph Smith started a cult, and uh, and and he told everyone that he uh, that God and Jesus had come to talk to him in the uh, forest. Um, I think maybe some of us have had God and Jesus come and talk to us in the forest. Uh, while we were maybe snacking on certain things and yeah. we didn't then go start a cult, but he did. Um, then he uh, claimed that he dug up a golden book from the ground and then translated it into basically a fan fiction of the Bible. So it takes all of the best parts about the Bible and makes them better. Uh, and then he started a church. And when he went after he started the church, he um, started doing polygamy which is kind of like a thing that cult leaders do. I don't know if you've right. followed very many cult leaders, but often what they'll do is they'll have kind of the pattern that they'll follow is they, they have some kind of special insight into God and they are the only ones who can interpret it. And then they gather a following of people who are just really drawn to them. And then they immediately start marrying all of the women. Um, yeah. Right. Well, and, I don't know if you know anything about David Koresh. Yes. So I, I, I actually watched Waco like a, uh, a couple months ago. And when I watched it, I was like, this is eerily familiar. Like the way that the community <clears throat> functioned felt like the community that I grew up in. And I did kind a, of like, uh, it's kind I of like being a, a rock star. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like being a rock star in a way. Like you kind of totally. gain this like um celebrity yeah. amongst your own people. And so yeah. Yeah, you're like you're like a religious rock star, and and what like one of the way things I love about the the Waco show that it, as it was showing the way that David Koresh is portrayed is that David Koresh is extremely charismatic. 
right? He is, mm-hmm. he is like, you want to listen to him. You want to, he has this way of being the way, this way of sort of showing what's true underneath the everyday yeah, yeah. reality that we see that I think is really appealing to people. Like uh, that, that, that's, that hooks people. It kind of grabs them. Um, and that's kind of what cult leaders do. Like they sort of prey on our desire to be on the inside. Right. Right. And then they can, they can spin a really good story. Mm-hmm. That's what was interesting is I did a um, a three part series like audio series retelling the story of uh, the massacre at Waco, mm-hmm. and the, my first episode was like firmly on David Koresh and some of his teaching and stuff like that. And in that episode, I said I actually said, and so I'm glad you say it as well. I said, you know, when you're thinking of David Koresh, you don't need to think of him like he thinks he's Jesus or he thinks he's God or anything like that. He right. is just a new version of, of Joseph Smith. Exactly. Yeah. And I was like, so I'm very happy to hear you say that. Cause I was like, that was my takeaway when I was reading what he was doing. Yeah. I, I so, so I, I watched that anyway. So kind of getting back to the, the question of like my yeah. family, right? So, so Joseph Smith starts this cult and then, uh, and, and, some sometimes sometimes certain Mormons get really upset with me that I call Mormonism a cult, and I so I want to maybe preface that by saying I don't. Sometimes when people call something a cult, it's like they'll say that like CrossFit is a cult, and it's kind of like this. It's kind of like a dig or like a like it's yeah. derogatory. I don't right. I don't use it derogatorily at all. To me, <clears throat> right as a society, okay. we have decided that there are certain criteria, and if a group meets those criteria, it's a cult. Right, a, a really yeah. great model for this is called the bite model by this guy named Stephen Hassan, who's like one of the foremost experts on cults in the United States. And the bite model simply says if an if a organization engages in behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotion control, those are those are the hallmarks of a cult. They will do right. those four things. And so Mormonism, all different brands of Mormonism do all of those things. They control they try to control how you behave. They regulate the things that you can do with your body, the things you can put into your body. Mm-hmm. They try, they control the flow of information that you have, and they will, they will demonize and villainize sources of information that are not correct. And they try to control your thoughts because they tell you that not only do your actions matter, but your very thoughts are recorded by God. And so they're trying to limit and control that. And then they try to control your emotions. They try to actually emotionally manip- manipulate you into peak experiences. So that, and then they tell you that's God speaking to you. Right. Wow. So when I call Mormonism a cult, I'm not trying to bag on it. I'm just trying yeah. to accurately label it. Right. 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 And, and so Joseph Smith founds the Mormon cult. He gets killed, uh, 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 you know, uh, in 1844. And when he dies, the, the movement that he has kind of splinters. And some of them stay back in Illinois, which was where they were at the time. And they go on to become what's called the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or now it's called the the Community of Christ. And that that is the first major bucket of Mormonism. And it is probably the most integrated into society. It's the most like other evangelical churches. Um, They they gave women the priesthood ages ago. They uh, got rid of the racist policies ages ago. Yeah. Like all of the major things that are problematic in the Mormon cult, they kind of moved on from quite a while ago because they were back in Illinois. They had to sort of interact with the rest of the culture yeah. and the rest of the civilization right. and they moved on with them. Um, the other group then went into Utah, which was a desert at that time with like in Mexico, right? There was, there were, there were, there was nothing out here except for, yeah. except for Utes. And the Mormons got rid of them really quickly uh, in some very unfortunate ways. Because they weren't white and delightsome? They weren't white and delightsome. Yeah. Uh, that's that's what happens when you take a really racist ideology of the 1830s of America and then turn it into a cult. <laughs> yeah. Um, not great things. So that, that group is the group that practiced polygamy. And that group has, then like eventually they abandoned polygamy in like the 1890s. And that the group that abandoned polygamy became what's called the LDS Church today, right? The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, which is what most people think of when they think of Mormons, right? They're the right. people right. With name tags and the the big, you know, castle bicycles. Temples, the bicycles. They're the ones that the Book of Mormon musical was made made out of or made. The made about. Tabernacle Choir people. The Tabernacle Choir is the LDS Church, right? right? The Temple Square, like all of the things that you traditionally think of as Mormon, that's the LDS Church usually. Okay. But then there's this, so that's kind of the second bucket. So there's reorganized, there's the LDS church, and then there's Mormon polygamy, which was basically all of the people who wanted to keep living polygamy 
and split from the LDS church and then have sort of splintered into groups since then. So there are, there are literally probably hundreds of teeny tiny Mormon polygamous groups all around. The biggest ones are the FLDS faith, which is what uh, Warren Jeffs was in charge of. Yeah. And, and then what he's in prison, right? He's in jail. Yeah. Rightfully so. Hopefully getting all kinds of terrible things done to him. Yeah. I don't like, I don't generally wish the ill of, of most humans, but that guy is, is he, he deserves to experience a modicum amount of suffering to understand what he did to other people. Yeah. Um, okay. so there's the FLDS and then the AUB, which is the group that I came from. So that was a really long backstory to say, to answer your question, <laughs> Cam, which is, uh, my family has been a part of Mormonism since its inception. Oh, wow. And they have been on both sides, on my dad's side and on my mom's side. There have been members of our family who have been part of the Mormon church, uh, the Mormon cult since 1830. So for wow. almost 200 years, my family has been involved in this cult. And they've been in and out of polygamy. So a lot of them did live it when, when all of them were living it back in the late 1800s. And then when the LDS church split off, my family stayed with the, the group that didn't practice polygamy up until my grand, my grandpa on my dad's side and then my dad. So oh, my okay. grandpa and my dad actually were, they grew up, and my mom too, they grew up in the LDS church. And then they exited the LDS church to join a Mormon polygamous group. Right, okay. Right. So that's so, so same same story for the sister wives show. Yes. That, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, wow. so my uncle Cody was 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 another brother uh, at the time when when my family was all when my dad's family was all kind of like deciding to go the way I describe it is it's like they they went deeper down into the into the hole of Mormonism, right? So, mm -hmm. so the LDS Church is like the third layer of Mormon hell. Mormon polygamy is like <laughs> in, in like seventh and eighth level, and they were like, this isn't restrictive enough. Let's go deeper. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> so are we talking about when you see on television, you see women in like little prairie, little house yes. on the prairie garb and things like that? Yeah. So that's the, that's, that's more the FLDS group. The okay. AED, which is a group that I, that my family belonged to, they, uh, they don't, they don't, you can still spot them. Like I've got a pretty good pligdar. And basically like you just look for people with like long sleeves and, and long, long pants in June in Utah. And you're like, yeah, you are, you're a Mormon polygamist. <laughs> Because they do wear what are called garments, which are this this like sacred underclothing, the magic underwear, magic underwear. Yeah. yeah uh, okay. Mormon polygamist is basically magic long john underwears, and and yeah. so they have to wear it. Uh, so they have to wear clothes that cover that. Um, but they didn't wear like the prayer dresses and sort of the swooped hair that that you kind of see. That's right. that's sort of ninth level of Mormon hell, which is uh, the FLDS Church. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> because I think people like me kind of on the outside of it are only experienced with that in any kind of realistic sense, other than what we see on television, which is not the realistic sense mm -hmm. is that we see these news stories where these women with swooped hair and little house right. and prairie dresses are all kind of being marched out by police. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it seems like every woman's worst nightmare. Totally. Are we, right. It, so how accurate is that? Are these women happy to be there or is it like really, you have to maintain this level of control or they will all run away. So this one's, this one's kind of tricky because like, I'm, I'm not a woman. And so I can't speak for the experience that, that they oh, sure. are having. Um, here's what I would say I, I've observed. And here's my thoughts having grown up in that environment. Um, the reason that people practice polygamy is because they believe that God requires it in order for them to go to I, it's not exactly heaven, but it's like the yeah. tippy top of heaven. Because in Mormonism, there are, there are hierarchies of heaven, and so okay. you, there are basically three different heavens you can get into. And if you get into the bottom two heavens, you don't get to have genitals. So oh. you get to live for forever. Dang! You don't get to you don't get to bang. You you get Ken dolled. Um, so if you want to have genitals in the afterlife, you have to live polygamy. So to go to the sexy afterlife. <laughs> to go to the sexy afterlife. And the, the real bummer there for women is that your job in the afterlife is basically to just birth spirit babies yeah. for the rest of eternity. Um, and then you don't get to get be taught because, and then God, like the male gods go out and like create earths. So it's evenly split, right? They, 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 it's a real bummer, yeah. Yeah. Well, so I think that, so there's this, there's this uh, cartoon that's out there. I don't know if you've seen it, Ben, but it explains Mormonism. Oh. 
Yeah. And I'm not talking about the South Park version, which is hilarious. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the South Park? I know what you're talking about, the old South Park. The old South Park version is hilarious and almost like I would say 95% accurate. Right. But there's there's this other cartoon out there that explains Mormon theology, essentially. And so I guess, um, I don't know if Jessica knows this stuff. So okay. if you I've could- I've seen this cartoon before, yeah. It's so good. It's so it's so funny um, in the worst possible way. But I laugh every time I look at Mormon Jesus. Um, but- <laughs> Yeah, Mormon but, Mormon Jesus. Right, yeah. And, and it's, God- the the beliefs in mormonism around america and it's it's so wild it's it, so wild but so spiritual babies so could you very briefly talk to us about uh cuz you could get it from that cartoon if you'd want to but uh how um i, I don't want to go too in the weeds cuz i want to hear your story right but, yeah, so, so i i can i can maybe touch on this really quick so the the okay. idea there right is that so, so a core idea in Mormon theology is that the reason that we're here is cola, that cola. we, yeah, the reason that we're here is because we used to be alive before we were born on this planet called Kola, which is um, a magical planet where God lives that the sun, our sun actually orbits around. So I don't know if you knew this, Jessica, or not, but it turns out that our sun is actually revolving around a planet, which is so surprising, like. <laughs> It, right because how I, does physics even work right i mean right well i mean it's it's right. god physics so god physics works in its own mysterious ways and uh we grew up on that planet and but when we were there we were just spirits so we were like ghosts right and we didn't have our physical bodies and god had a physical body but yeah. for some reason when he birthed us we were birthed as spirits i don't know exactly why it was like Misfire. None of your business. That's really why none of my business. What goes on between and, sky daddy and, that, and mommy? And that God, to be clear, is not the first God. Correct. He no, would have had a father as well for forever and forever. Like this is a this is a thing that has been happening for for uh, for generations upon generations of eons of time. And uh, so it's like it's like we have a grandpa God. We have a great grandpa God. We have a great, 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 great grandpa God, and that's just the beginning. Yeah, this is why I laugh because it's it's just it's so it's it's so funny because they're like we're Christians too, and it's like but you your your very understanding is like completely different, totally different cosmology, totally different, completely different. It's so funny to me. Yeah. So, so, so the plan was that God would create earth and, and then on earth, uh, we would all get a chance to come down and get bodies. And if we're righteous, then we can return to Kolob with our genitals intact. And if we're not, then we go to a different planet where there are no genitals, um, mm. which is like probably where David Bowie will end up. So that <laughs> in the outer darkness is not going to we can only hope. Be around. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so kind of circling back to 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 uh, Jessica to your question about so so do the women want to be there? So in order to get into this highest degree of it's called the highest degree of the celestial kingdom, that's where they believe that they'll go. Um, you have to be in a plural marriage relationship in Mormon polygamy, right? So the LDS okay. Church has changed that doctrine, and they've said no. That's what Joseph Smith said. That's what Brigham Young said. That's what a number of prophets after him said. But the LDS, the current LDS Church, is like actually no. Those people they didn't say that, or they didn't mean it when they said it. It's not that. Yeah, because they wanted statehood. Because they wanted right. statehood. Yeah, and they want to they right. want to be able to appeal to a broader group of people. But but so the so to answer your question, are they forced? I mean, no one no one is holding a gun to their head. Right. No right. one is, no one is, but, but imagine that you live your entire life in a, in a story that tells you that your value comes from your ability to be a mother and have children and to do that for eternity. And that the best way to ensure your eternal salvation is to make sure that you are married to someone who is very righteous and who has multiple wives. Because if you just marry so dude with one wife, or if you just marry a dude who's not married, it may not like he, maybe he won't get married again, right? There's a there's a risk there, and so it's yeah. a safer and better option to marry someone who's already married, um, and that's and that's what they so so I wouldn't say that they believe that they're being forced. I think they would say I'm choosing this of my own free will, 
Right. But the context in which they are choosing it is is very controlled. And I don't and, and I and, and I don't think they're happy. I think that their experience of it is very painful. In fact, growing up, we were taught that the one of the reasons why plural marriage was required is that it only it was hard enough to cause the suffering that was necessary for people to be purified to live with God. Wow. So in a way, it's actually like way worse than a gun. It's, it's actually way worse than a gun. Yeah, because here's yeah. the thing, right? If someone has a gun to your head, you can I can I swear on this podcast? Go for Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Okay. If someone has a gun to your head, you fucking know that they have a gun to your head, right? Like yeah. you're aware of that. But if someone has very carefully woven strands of story your entire life to make you believe something, you don't always know that you're enslaved. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, it, there's the been a lot of conversation recently about grooming and mm -hmm. about different, uh, e even in some, uh, some like more mainstream Christian people have talked about how, Oh, it's normal for this to happen in this. And it's not, it's not, I say mainstream, but it's even within their certain sects. It's even smaller right. sect, but it's within the, the dialogue. And this mm -hmm. is just like spiritual abuse and spiritual grooming. Totally. It's 100%. disturbing. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the reasons that I've started speaking out, right? One of the reasons I've, I'm glad to have the platform that I do, and I, I'm trying to grow it as much as I can, is that I, I don't, I think people should be able to be whatever religion they want to be, right? A hundred percent. If they're, if religion is something that brings you joy, fucking go for it, man. Like live that thing. Right. And even, even like some people have asked me, well, what do you think about polyamory, right? Polyamory compared to polygamy. And I always say, look, polyamory, if you can find more than one person that loves you and wants to be in a relationship with you, go for it. Like a hundred percent, make that, make that happen. But polyamory is not polygamy, right? Religion right. is not polygamy because these things are, there's coercion, there's manipulation, there's a control of the narrative and of information that flows into the, the person's mind. So they actually can't make a choice. Right. Yeah. So that's so different than what is portrayed by shows, say like Sister Wives, for example, mm -hmm. where I, a person like me from the outside or the secular world is watching that. And I'm kind of thinking, well, they're not hurting anybody. Why right. not let them do what they want to do? And what's not kind of shown there is sort of like the um, coercion aspect, which is telling these people, especially these women, that you're just not going to go to heaven or you're going to be kendalled for all intents and purposes <laughs> if you don't participate in something that is like, extremely counter to our natures in my right. opinion um so yeah that's that's really interesting because that was kind of my first take when i was watching this i'm like okay that's an abnormal way to live but nobody should be stopped from doing it right and so th that's a difficult line to walk especially if you have a seemingly grown adult woman fully in her capability saying no no this is what i want yeah and that's that's where it gets a little bit tricky right is i don't know that i would say we should regulate it or we should make it illegal. I'm, I'm actually glad like recently polygamy was decriminalized in Utah. I okay. don't support polygamy. I don't think it's a healthy lifestyle for people. And I'm really glad it's decriminalized yeah, because yeah. what that's done is it's, it's sort of brought it out of hiding. And mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so what, as it comes out of hiding though, I think it's really important for us to have frank conversations about what it does. Right. And so like, I recently posted a video, kind of my, people were asking me forever, like, they're like, what do you think about Sister Wives? And I was like, well, I don't watch it, but I did finally do a response where I said, look, even though I don't watch it, I actually have a really big problem with the genre that it's in, which is sort of this, this genre of reality shows. Because there's, there's this one, there's like My Five Wives. There are a couple of different polygamy um, reality shows out there. And it seems to be that what the, what the people are trying to do is sort of portray it as a happy kind of like legitimate, problem-free right. family environment. And I just don't think that's the case. I, I don't have any experience that says that. The, the one maybe exception might actually be the sister wives family from my experience of them, because none of the children have decided to live polygamy and they were allowed to leave and even encouraged by their family. They were told it's okay that, that you do that, right? Okay. Okay. That's awesome. And that is a very rare occurrence, right? That I'm in the same extended family. That didn't happen to me, right? When right. I decided to exit, I wasn't told whatever you decide is, is great. I was told you're going to be buffeted by the winds of Satan for the rest of your life. 
which has actually been true, but it turns out that Satan's buffetings are just really, really nice. It's like a <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, so I would kind of want to get into that because I want to know what someone who grows up surrounded by this lifestyle told this mythos of, you know, la layers of heaven and, and the sexy heaven and all of these <laughs> things. At what point do you go, something's deeply wrong here? And then how do you go in from get that point right. to getting out? Yeah. Can, can I ask you one question before we, we get to totally. there? Is I just, just in your family history, um, you said your grandfather kind of got back into the polygamy game. Mm -hmm. Do you think he was convinced that it was the right thing to do? Or did he, do you think it was about having more wives? Well, what's weird about it is that actually the impetus came from my grandma. Mm. Okay. It weird. was actually, it was actually my LDS grandma who had, had done some reading and, and she felt that because of the way that when, when she read early Mormon texts, she read them as in order to be, the, the, the best kind of Mormon you could possibly be, you would have, the polygamy was required. And so okay. in this kind of weird, uh, I think a lot of, and that's why, that's uh, again, why I'm like, I think that the, the way that we perceive polygamy is sometimes misunderstood because we think, oh, it's because, it's because people, it's because dudes want more wives. And there's okay. definitely like, that was definitely why it started. And that's definitely yeah. why a number of the leaders do it. But there's also a whole group of people with, who are sort of lower down who have already sort of seeded their uh, ability to kind of decide what is true to a higher, to, to the Mormon cult. And the Mormon cult says polygamy is required. And so men are, are engaging. There are, there are men who are marrying multiple wives in Mormon polygamy who really don't want to. Yeah. And there are women who are doing that who really don't want to, but they feel like they have to. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's what, that's what I was curious about. But so, yeah, let's talk about your, get back into your story. So, um, set the, set the stage. Your father has how many wives? Yeah. So my dad, uh, when, when my dad, uh, entered polygamy, he did it, uh, he got married two times at the same time. So he married my mom and my, and another mom, and they both, both of them were coming from the LDS church as well. So all three of them kind oh, of met, okay. they decided they were going to do polygamy together. And then they, they all got married to, at the same time. And then I'm my mom's oldest from that. So, so my other mom had a, another son from a previous marriage. And then she had another boy that's like 13 days older than me. So I kind of have like a twin. And then I was born. And then after that, there were, there was kind of like the pattern of two that was followed for a while. And then eventually we got to maybe six years in, my dad did marry a sec, a third wife, but she stuck around for like a year and then left. Okay. And so, for mo so the 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 family that I have is is relatively small by by polygamous standards. I have fifteen siblings, and I have I have basically two moms. I've got a third one, but like it may be like two point one moms. Yeah, right. She got out. She got out. Yeah, I'm a little I'm a little pissed that she didn't take me with with her. But <laughs> no, you got to do what you got to do. Okay. So two moms, fifteen siblings, mm -hmm. I, which is crazy. Like that sounds insane for i don't know how the split was but you know first eight eight and eight as yeah. a basic idea okay. is it seems crazy but at the same time my great grandmother was one of eight so it's like yeah. that was somewhat normal it is back in the day but now it's that's unheard of it's 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 almost unheard of right there are, there are some families that have that that many and and that's again small like i know i know families in polygamy where they're having 10 or 12 kids per mom and so, exactly. and, and actually that's, that's one of the reasons why they believe polygamy is important is that they believe that again, kind of going back to the spirit baby concept up in heaven, there are a whole bunch of spiritual babies. Oh, there's a holding cell. There's a holding cell, right? There's a queue and the ones that are not born. And so the fewer babies that polygamists have, the more spirit babies have to get born in wicked families like yours. Oh, that's sad. It is sad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry that I laugh at these horrible things. But, it's just <laughs> but that's, that's the mentality, right? And their idea there is, so so they literally believe we have to have as many babies as we possibly can to save those babies from another childhood. So it's like, like uber, uber pro-life talk. Like uber, uber pro-life. Pro -life. Yeah. Wild. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Which See, often being... Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, I was just gonna say what, which often means that that you you have 
one of the biggest problems that I have with, with Mormon polygamy and one of the reasons, like one of the causes that I'm like trying to champion and push forward is, and is to advocate for the children, because what that means is, I mean, essentially every polygamist wife is a single mom who sometimes has help, right? Who, who every, every couple of days will have a dude show up and, and, you know, to, to be there. And yeah. they're single moms of, you know, anywhere from eight to 12 kids. So there is, there is not adequate care given to the children of people who, who are living in Mormon polygamy. I don't know so it's not... who, who is well cared for. So it's not like, okay, so going back to sister wives, and I'm so sorry, because that's my frame of reference here. Right. They kind of have this, like, there's three houses and the backyards are all connected. And so like all the moms take care of all the kids. Um, where it's like a sort of like commune sort of uh, way that the children are taken care of. And I remember watching that and kind of thinking like, yeah, that, that seems like the women get a lot of help, but it's, it seems like it's the opposite. Like you're on your own with just your kids. Yeah. And, and that, that, that depends on families. Some families do kind of operate in sort of more of that communal way, but even right, right. the, I mean, it, so it's like, it's not, it's not, Hey, I have three kids. It's not like me and I, I have three kids and then I, and me and my wife, have another wife and then she helps with those three kids right right it's right. i have three kids with this wife and i also have three kids so even if there is sort of this lateral help which often is there you're you're multiplying the number of children exponentially so it's not a matter of oh look there are now five adults to care for five children no in my family there were three adults to care for fit for 16 children right okay it seems like a lot of the responsibility will probably be shunted off onto older children 100 percent yeah. Right. So you have you have babies raising babies. Yeah. Bummer. Yeah. Okay. So as one of sixteen, growing, did did y'all live more like did you have internet or were you closer so we, to the the F F L D S? We lived we lived on uh on a little kind of property that was about five miles outside of the the closest town. The closest town was like two thousand people, and they were almost all L D S Mormons. So they kind of shunned and hated us, especially since my family kind of left that community. So right. they kind of gave them the middle finger, and then they they were like, "We ostracize you," which which sucked. Um, but we had like we lived in trailers, so so we had like trailers. We had electricity. Um, we didn't have television. We eventually got. I think we got internet in like two thousand. It was before I, well, actually, was it? Yeah, so we probably got internet in like 2006. And, wow. and like, but it was like really controlled how much, what, what, we, what we, you could do with it. We had a TV, but the media that we saw was really controlled. Like, so like, for example, I wasn't allowed to watch like Lion King or Little Mermaid because they are very wicked shows where children disobey their parents. Mm -hmm. And, but I, but I did get, well, I was able to watch like Star Wars. So it's sort of okay. this weird filter of like what gets through and what doesn't get through. And it kind of just, it was basically dependent on the whim of my dad. Like if my dad thought that something was okay, we could, we could watch that. And if he didn't, then we couldn't. Okay. Interesting that, I don't know, like something like Star Wars or that has sort of like fantastical religious type elements in it is cool. Right. But you know, a show where a kid might be disobedient to a parent. Absolutely not. You know, Absolutely like, not. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and also like, I'm listening to this thinking, like I'm the single child of a single parent and I have no children of my own. So this is an opposite world that totally. I've, to anything I've ever lived in before. Yeah. I mean, imagine <laughs> I'm, I'm even now just thinking about like our, our, our childhoods were so different. Just the, the daily experience is is a totally different experience. I had none of my media. Like I probably should have had my media monitored on some right. level, <laughs> and never, never was not forbidden from watching anything, not forbidden from reading anything. Um, mm -hmm. you had mentioned kind of when we started talking before the show that there that you did have access to books though. And yeah. So so I I was always really voracious. I and so I, I read like all the books that were available there, which was like there were like like scripture books and then like some encyclopedias and stuff. And then okay. one of the, re one of the things I'm really grateful to my mom about is that she would take me into the library at, at the, at the, in the town couple, couple, maybe every other week or something like that. And I would just check okay. out okay. whatever books I wanted. And for a while there was an attempt to sort of control, again, going back to this information control, there was an attempt to control the, 
the books that I was reading. Like my dad once said, he was like, Hey, I don't want Ben reading any books that, or I didn't call me Ben. I don't want Benjamin reading any books that uh, I haven't read. And that was put in place for a while. But eventually my mom was like, he's bored out of his mind. Like he, there's, there was just no way that they could keep up with what I was reading. And so, so my mom went to bat for me and I was able to, to, to read pretty extensively. And, and the, the, I mean, the, the nice thing about that is that once you get, once you're able to do that, you can start to kind of grab a lot of it. So I loved fantasy. So I grabbed like a whole bunch of like, I read like the Robert Jordan books and like the Lord of the Rings and like, uh, 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 Terry, um, Terry Brooks. And those were, if my parents knew what was in those books, they would not have been cool with me reading them. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, especially because they like, uh, they directly banned Harry Potter. So I didn't get to read Harry Potter until I was like, until I was an adult. Um, yeah. But Wheel of Time, they didn't know anything about. Wheel of so. Time, they were like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> my dad, my dad, yeah. ask, I'd be delivering with my dad and he'd ask me to like read it out loud. And I knew, I was like, there's some stuff in here that he's not going to like. So I would edit it while I was reading it out loud to keep it kosher. Because so I was like, I don't want to <laughs> ban this book from me because they're amazing. My man. <laughs> yeah. And they're like this thick. So I'm they're, sure your dad was like, I'm not going to be reading that. I'm not going to read that. Yeah. So, so um, growing up, were you like obedient were you uh, I was pretty uh, obedient yeah so i okay. i cared and so this is kind of going back jessica maybe it's your question about you know yeah. how did what where did the cracks start to come from and right. my whole life right as as long as i can remember i all i've always really cared about it's been important to me to be a good person right it's, it's doing doing what's right matters to me right i want to right. that's just that there's something about the way that that ben is made up that that's that's something that's important to him and so, uh, and that, that idea sort of got hijacked by Mormon polygamy. And so what they, right. what they teach you in that is they say, okay, you, you want to do what's right. They teach you this idea that the natural man is an enemy to God. And what that means is your natural body, the feelings that you have, your gut intuition, your anything that comes from your body is bad. So don't listen to that. That's not what's true. What's true is what has been revealed to us by God, right. and we will teach you it, right? Yeah. And so very early on, there was a there was a big conflict between what I felt was good in my body and what I had been told. And the, the example that stands out the most to me is that, uh, so so Mormonism, in addition to having a number of other problems, is also a, is an, inc is an incredibly racist ideology where they believe that the, the, in, in Mormon doctrine, it has been stated that, that uh, being black is a curse from God, and that if you are black, you will you, not on the. It is not possible for you on this earth to have the ordinances that are necessary for you to be exalted afterward. Right. Well, that really surprises me because the Mormons that I know are black. Yeah. yeah. Well, they nineteen seventies. Nineteen seventies. They changed that. The oh, LDS. Wow. And it's very so. It's very recent, right? So if you've, I don't know if you have you seen the Book of Mormon musical or, or listened to the music. I, I've gotten bits and pieces, like I've seen clips and some of the songs. There's a line I've... in there where he says, in 1978, God changed his mind about black people. And that's what it's referring to, is that in 1978, the LDS church received revelation that black members of the church could now get the priesthood and the ordinances that they, uh, <laughs> that they, uh, that you need in order to basically go to the, the good heaven, right? And so that's baked in. And, and it's, and the LDS church has really tried to move on and sort of distance themselves from that and say, look, that was never really like, but, but still in the book of Mormon, which is the core book of the, of, of Mormonism, it, it explicitly says that God cursed people who were wicked with dark skin. Yeah. And the good ones wow. he made white and delightsome. And the good ones he made white and delightsome, right? So I didn't is, know what is, you meant by when you said that. That's incredible. It is it is overtly racist, right? And they they still have not disavowed that. So Mormon polygamy though is like they they want to grab all of the things that Mormons that LDS Mormons have sort of moved on from and they believe that it's their job to sort of maintain those and kind of keep those plain and precious truths alive. And so this racist ideology that black people are cursed from for something that they did, so going back to the spirit babies, right? Yeah. In in that story, what they believe is that when we were ha making this plan about what's going to happen when we come down to earth, Satan stood up and he proposed a different plan to God. 
and about a third of the spirit babies went with Satan and about a third of the spirit babies went with God. And there was this big fight and Satan and his spirit babies got thrown down to earth, which is where all the, the which is now they're demons, by the way. Um, and then a third didn't do, they were like, they, they were called the fence sitters. So they just kind of like sat around and like, they were like, we'll join whichever side wins. And Mormon polygamy says that that group, they were cursed by God. And those people are black people today. Oh my God. Right. I'm sorry. I'm processing. It's wild. It's, <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it is literally white supremacy, right? It's, yeah. it's, there's no other term for it. And which was, so when, when everything was blowing up, you know, a couple of years ago with, with BLM and, and there was sort of the backlash to BLM where people were saying, look, there's not white supremacy. Like white supremacy isn't an issue in America today. And I don't want to really necessarily get into that art, that, that conversation, but I heard that, I heard that. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? I was raised as a white supremacist. I was yeah. taught as an, in America that I was special because of the color of my skin. And that other people were cursed because of the color of their skin. And if that's not white supremacy, I don't know what the fuck is. Right. right. Oh, so that makes me even more interested to be like, what was the point where you started to be like, okay, something's deeply wrong here. Right. So that, so that's actually, that's, this is the, the sort of the point where, where it kind of came from is um, because I read so much, I was aware of like the civil war. I knew a little bit about Martin Luther King. And so I, I kind of knew some of that story and it, it felt so wrong. Like the, the idea that I just because of the color of my skin, because of my bloodline was mm -hmm. better than someone else felt so deeply wrong in my body. But I've been, I've been told my body's bad, right? These so, right. so there's this conflict and I just, I just sort of experienced it internally of I'm, I'm bad because I feel this softness for the, towards this idea, towards these people that I feel like are just people, mm -hmm. but that's wrong of me, right? That's, that's a weakness that needs to be kind of ground out. But I remember very vividly when I was about five or six, a member, like a, an, an uncle from my mom's side who they were, they stayed LDS and they, this was after they'd sort of moved on from that he moved on from the, the racist ideology. They came to visit us and I listened to my dad describing this belief system to my uncle. And I remember feeling just profoundly ashamed. Like, yeah. I was like, I was like, oh my God, don't. Like, it's bad enough that we have to believe this, but don't talk about it to other people. Right. Because they are not, like, they are not going to they, 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 they're going to look at us with abhorrence. Right. Because it is abhorrent. Right. And so I felt that really distinctly. And I was just, I would call that sort of the beginning of the crack. And then as I sort of grew up and started to have more experiences, I felt that crack more deeply. Right. When I, when I became a teenager and I started to like go through puberty and, and I started to kind of have a sexual awakening, like all humans do, that was another mm -hmm. spot where I was like, Oh, my body is wanting me to do things. Right. I'm having these things in my body, but my body's bad, right? These things are bad. And so I, I experienced that really up until the time when I decided to leave polygamy and, and join the LDS church, which, which happened around 2010. And at that, at that moment, I was sort of able to, to release that. And I was able to say, oh, okay, all of these things that I've been, that I've been resisting with my body that have felt really bad to believe, I actually don't have to believe those anymore. I can sort of put yeah. those down. And I, I can't describe how much of a relief that was to be able to just say, oh, I, I don't have to choose between what God, the most powerful being in the universe has commanded me to do and what feels good to me. Mm -hmm. I can trust what feels good to me. Mm -hmm. And it's been sort of a steady unpacking and an expansion of that. What I can trust what feels good to me. That has been a big part of my healing journey of being able to just say, look, I can let go of these things that were from the outside that were sort of forcing me into a way of being that wasn't in line in, in alignment with who I really am. And I can actually just trust who I really am because it turns out I'm a really nice guy. Right. And my natural sort of innate urges to be human in the best possible way that I can be are yeah. going to guide me in a good way. Yeah, that, that's what's you, you talking about this is so interesting to me because I actually have a degree in biblical studies. Oh, but, wow. You know, cr Christian side of things rather than Mormon. Right. Um, but 
what's interesting to me is you are dis when you're describing Mormonism, what you're describing is like the most uh, how to most fantastical and stringent version of Gnosticism. Totally. Which, which is fascinating to me because if you actually look at church history, the first century, there was a big fight against, you know, the apostles had the fight, the, the church fathers had the fight against Gnostics who were saying, no, your body's bad. It's right. evil, blah, mm -hmm. blah. And then, and then they're like, no, what about Genesis where he said it was good? So it's just fascinating that you mentioned that because Gnosticism is alive and well in Mormonism and in mainline Christianity yeah. to this day. It yeah, and that, crazy. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't come across Gnosticism until I'd left, and then when I, when I heard it, I, like after, I, after I left uh, the LDS Church, I sort of went on a, a bit of a science and religion bender where I learned, like I learned as much as I could about science, and I learned as much as I could about other religions, and so I came across Gnosticism, and I was like, that's fascinating, right? That really does describe this idea of like the Earth, your body, these things are bad, but they've been injected by this spirit from from heaven. That is going to purify them, um, which I or, think, is, or they'll be destroyed in in the future. Yeah, or they'll right. be burned. <laughs> <laughs> right, which which I actually think is an that's I think is that's an incredibly toxic, and I would even say that's an abusive thing to do to children. Right, yeah. it's, yeah. it's abusive to tell children that their bodies are bad and that their the the natural and normal things that their bodies are going to do are bad. Mm, um, right. And it, I think that, I mean, Utah has one of the highest rates of teen suicide. I think the highest rate of teen suicide wow. in, the, in the entire country. And I, I can guarantee that a big part of that stems from this slow indoctrination their entire lives of them believing that their bodies are bad. And then what do bodies do when they turn 13 and 14? They start to play with sexual energy because that's what bodies do. Yep. And when you believe that that's bad, you just create this... this it's you're at war with yourself, right? And I was at war with myself for almost three decades before I finally was able to sort of unpack that and say, no, it's okay to just be me. Right. This might be something of a personal question. If it is, feel free to just toss it. But um, through all of this, you, you um, were you able to maintain any of your faith after going through so much indoctrination that turned out to be false? So I, when I left, when I left, the Mormonism entire, I left Mormonism entirely in 2015. And for about, I went basically on like a five year binge of like, I'm an atheist. I'm an act. I was kind of just like, I don't know. Right. I don't know. Right. And I'm going to assume nothing. I'm going to assume that this is the life that I have. And I'm going to, I did, I did study a lot of other religions, but it wasn't because I wanted to get into another religion. It was more that I was mm -hmm. curious about yeah. other ways of, of believing. So like I, 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 I read a bunch of other religious texts. I studied Buddhism. I studied Hinduism. I studied Islam, um, uh, Sikhism, like just a whole bunch of different stuff. Right. And uh, and then I also went really hardcore into science. So I, I took a ton of science courses from the great courses. Um, and and my goal there was I wanted to be able to like be able to ground myself in what's actually real. And that was uh, that was great. That was actually wonderful. Like that was about five years of my life where I I sort of grounded in that. And then uh, a Kind of towards the end of that, I read a book called uh, Sapiens, which is by a, a guy named Yuval Noah Harari, and, and he's a historian. And Sapiens is it's the subtitles it's, it's a brief history of humankind, and essentially what it is is it he looks at how uh, Homo sapiens, right, which is the species that we are, was not the only hominid that existed 250,000 years ago when we came mm -hmm. us, right. There were other hominid species, and so right. he asks the question, why us? Why did we? make it? Why are we the, the ones that are here and none of the other ones are, are around? And the argument that he makes is that it's it's not because we were smarter. It's not because we were stronger. In fact, other when we look at the fossilized remains of other hominids, they had stronger bodies and they had larger brains than ours. And so we were not the smartest kids on the block. We were not the strongest kids on the block. But what we had was an ability to, to cooperate that was unparalleled by these other species. And the, the vehicle that allowed us to cooperate was our capacity for telling story or myth, right? If you think about what enabled humans to build the pyramids, it was because they believed that Pharaoh was the literal, was literally God. Right. You know, we're building it for his honor, right? So if you can weave a tale for humans and they believe it, 
uh, you can get them to do really spectacular things, right? I've experienced that directly. And what that kind of clued me into is this idea of, I think that in some ways, the human mind is, is really wired for belief and it's wired for myth. And I think that we feel more settled, more comfortable when we are in a myth that we can sort of just accept and sort of sort of live with. I think it's a little bit disconcerting for humans to exist outside of myth. Uh, yeah. Even you know, even people who are hardcore atheists or or like a, like a Carl Sagan, right? Carl Sagan is a guy that I I like fell madly in love with when I started getting into yeah. science. And he has he's if you read Carl Sagan, some of what he's doing is he's talking about science, but a lot of what he's doing is he's a myth maker. Yes, right? he's, he is giving an alternative myth that is grounded in science, but he's he's telling a story, right? He's giving us a way of seeing the world that is that allows us to feel like, feel comfortable and like we belong yep. in. So all yep. that is a really long way to say that that I've found my way back to what I would call a spirituality. And, and what I what I tell people is I don't believe in God in the traditional sense, right? I don't think that there's okay. a dude in the sky who's watching everything that we do. That to me is an incredibly limited view of God. Like when I think about, when I look up and I think about the literally trillions of galaxies that we can see, the idea that there is a, that, that God is this, is human and over earth is absurd to me. Like that is such, yeah. like that is such yeah. a tiny God to believe in because a God that I would believe in would have to be expansive enough to, to own all of this. Right. And so what I believe is I believe that, uh, I would call God the sum total of the present moment, right? So everything that is, as it is right now in time, all of it is God, right? And we're a part of that. We're not separate from it. We are actually mm -hmm. intimately part of that. Um, I believe that life is a cosmic imperative. And what I mean by that is that life is just something that the universe does. So right. on earth, the way that life kind of came out is humans, and tigers and like all of these very uniquely earth ways of life, but that life is just something that the, when the universe organizes itself, life is what happens. Um, and I think that because of that, humans were not anything special, and we also are incredibly special mm -hmm. because there's nothing unique or special about the creation of humans. But also, you will only ever find humans on Earth because it's only on Earth that the unique conditions arose to create what is us and mm -hmm. and we're marvelous right we are marvelous amazing spec like if if you think about the literally the worst human that has ever existed if we found that dude on mars we would lose our fucking mind <laughs> yeah fair enough um I, you're the first person I've heard um, describe Carl Sagan in the way that I have come to know and understand him as um, creating the, a mythos for atheist right. people to believe in. The pale blue dot is the the all story. It and is. the way that he describes human beings as a way for the universe to know itself mm -hmm. is a deeply accurate uh, portrayal of a atheistic universe where all of these particles of matter erupt from the Big Bang and come to organize them themselves in such a way is that they have eyes that can look up at the stars and understand what they are. Right. And it is when you when you try to frame that in the human mind, it's it's beautiful. It's it symphonic. Is. And um, just to hear like I, I've run into very many angry atheists who are atheists because they're angry at religion. Mm -hmm. And to hear someone who like really understands the artist the artistry in Carl Sagan is is such a pleasure. So oh, it's, thank it's you for that. Really <laughs> I love I love the way that you think about that. And and I would even say that like I I get I there I, I think there's a valid place in in the human experience for anger or religion because I think that anger anger is an emotion that sets a boundary and right says this is wrong. And I think mm -hmm. that, that religion in human history needs to be bounded. Right, we need mm -hmm. to tell it that it did some things wrong because it's hurting people. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that there's far more to life if you are if you can see it through the lens of beauty. Right, I would I would much rather experience life as it's beautiful than that I'm angry about something. Right. And um, I think there's so much beauty in the world, and I think there's even so much beauty in just the the if you can sort of release the dogma from myth and from religion. 
all of the multitude of ways that we've found of making meaning out of out of this 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 earth existence which is so when you when you really understand how unlikely it is that any of us are here it, it it's magical right it yep. i don't know i don't believe in a miracle like jesus walking on water but i don't fucking need that miracle because i'm here yeah. How unlikely is that? That's miraculous. Yeah. I mean, especially since it goes back to great, 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 great grandfather God. Exactly. <laughs> How did great, 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 great grandfather God know to make me? Right. 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 So one of the things I love is asking a guest a question just to watch Jessica's face as they answer it. Oh, I'm so Oh, excited. God. Let me buckle in for this. Okay. I... So no, uh, this isn't too bad, but I. Okay. I <clears throat> Speaking of differences between, you know, like my background, biblical studies and Mormonism, uh, Jesus, virgin birth or no? Oh, so I have a very interesting answer to this. Not virgin birth. No, uh, uh, God came down and had sex with Mary. And that's where Jesus comes from. So actually, the, I, the, the answer is even more interesting than that. So again, I'm going to, this is Mormon polygamy, right? So an LDS Mormon would say that, like some of them would actually believe some of what I'm going to say. But most of them would say that that is not what we actually believe. But there's okay. there's a paper trail, right? If you go back far enough in Mormonism, you'll you'll believe this. So uh, Joseph Smith taught, and at, and Brigham Young uh, confirmed that uh, God is actually Adam. So Adam, the first human, was God. And what God did, so God, remember, he had. Uh, this is going to get a little bit complicated, but basically God is what's called a resurrected being. So he has a physical body, but he doesn't have, yeah, you should, you should take a drink for this one. Uh, he, he, he Crack has another a, beer for this one. He Go has ahead. a physical body. I'm so excited to tell this to you. <laughs> he has a physical body, but instead of blood, he actually has spirit flowing through his, through his veins. Right. <laughs> Wait, right. Let, let me pause. Let me pause. Just because you know, I've I've studied spirit in the Christian context. What is spirit in that context? Because it, it, if you if, so, if you if you read Genesis ruach, or if you read the the Greek, it's pneuma, which both mean breath. Right. So air. Yeah. So um, you are getting far too um, educated to have this discussion because you're quoting original sources. And what I'm doing is I'm quoting that, things that people made up in their minds. None of your business, Cam. That's what he's saying. <laughs> Joseph Smith's like, never thought of it. Never Joseph thought Smith's about like, it. I've just, I just, I spontaneously prophesied this. <laughs> and I just think it's funny. Just a little aside. I think it's funny that Joseph Smith uh, translated the plates, not into his language of that time, the way he spoke, but chose the 1611 authorized King oh. James version way of translating. Like 100%. that's the only way God talks. <laughs> that is true God language. <laughs> yes. Cool seas. Cool seas. Yeah, totally. So, um, so spirit is spirit is basically like celestial blood. So it's like light. It's like I would I would call it how I imagined it as a child is like, it was like white blood. Okay. Like pure white blood and light. Shiny so it, was blood. Like, it was like, it was like uh, phosphorescent white blood. And, but there's a very interesting side effect of having spirit in your veins, which is when you have spirit running through your veins, you can't have a physical baby. You can only have a spiritual baby. Okay. So, okay. so God We'll, let's call him, we'll call him Michael because that's who they, so they believe that Michael and Adam are the same person and that Michael is God. So, I did not know about that because I know that the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Michael and Jesus are the same guy, but oh, I didn't I know, know that. that. I didn't Wait, know like that. the Archan the Archangel Michael? Yes. Archangel yes, Michael is, is God. Yes. And that's is that blasphemy. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> so if you think that's blasphemy, you're really going to hate what comes next. <laughs> okay. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so Michael, um, he has all of us. So he, Michael has a whole bunch of wives who are also resurrected beings and they all have, um, you know, uh, celestial sex because they've got their, they're not Ken dolled. And when he, when he does that, they have spirit babies. So spirit babies look like 
they look like our physical bodies, but they're spirits. So you can't, they're finer, right? You can't touch them. They're like ghosts. Right. Um, we needed bodies. And so God made earth. And then to get earth started, he took one of his wives and they went down to earth and they ate from the forbidden. So they ate the tree, the, the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, the forbidden fruit. And that partaking of the eating the elements, like the matter of the earth caused blood to flow through their veins again. And they became mortal. And then they fathered all of the people. And that's where we came from. And then when Adam dies in the book of more or in the Bible, he doesn't actually die. He just goes back to the garden of Eden and he eats from the tree of life which replaces the blood in his veins and spirit is now flowing in his veins. And then he becomes uh, God again, which means that for the first little part of the Bible, the first little part of Genesis, while Adam's alive, it's actually grandpa God who like came over to basically babysit while, while our God was oh down. God. It's so like, okay. What the fuck? It's, it's so great in the dumbest possible way. So good. So good. So I don't understand this. It's like they're taking the Bible and they're like, no, fuck that. Let's write our own story. But exactly. it's still the Bible. Exactly. How do you Why not? Because here's the thing. When you can when you can talk to God, well, this is this is what happened, right? Is that that uh evil men translated the Bible and they changed it. Right. Oh, okay. And so they all of these things they used <laughs> and to that's... be in the Bible. But, and that's and why they, Joseph Smith wrote it in King James. Which is why it's King <laughs> Exactly. It's just in case a precocious boy child named Benjamin ever accidentally gets a hold of a Bible and is like, what the fuck? It doesn't say that. Right. Like, yeah. okay. So yeah. I would I would read that and I'd be like, this doesn't make it. And they're like, well, that's because they changed it. That's the bad Bible. That's the bad Bible. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm processing as you're telling that. I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm just processing. No, you're great. You're great. I'm actually yeah. really enjoying your reaction. So, so uh, <laughs> that's the context. So, so when uh, God decided that he wanted to make Jesus, I don't know exactly how this worked because all of the rest of us were like, usually, oh, no, no, I know, I know why. It's because when you have a, a person with spirit in their veins and they have celestial sex with a person who also has spirit in their veins, they make a spirit baby. But when a person with spirit in their veins has sex with a person who has blood in their veins, they have a half spirit, half human baby. They make a Nephilim. They make a Nephilim, which is Jesus. What? Sorry. That's that's why G, that's where Jesus gets his powers is because he is he has some like he's got basically like blood spirit in his in his veins. It's like slightly whiter. That's why that's actually why Jesus was white in the Middle East <laughs> that he uh, is. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, that is the story that I was told, and I would say most of my, most of my family still believes that. Oh shit! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> yeah. Oh god, I, I we're don't... gonna we 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 talked to our friend Cody a couple times about this the concept of the Nephilim in the Bible and all of that, and I can't wait the next time we talk to him on the show to talk about how Jesus is a Nephilim. It's, it's fantastic. I'm so excited for him to to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I so. have so many things to say, and none of them are nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, so. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's all so funny to me. It's just it the in that South Park episode with the dum 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 is dum, the dum, best. Yeah, it was good. Is the best. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you you leave your polygamist family and you become LDS for a period. Yep. Um, so can you walk us through some of your major realizations as yeah. you left? Yeah, so so the the shift from polygamy to the LDS church is essentially that I wouldn't even really even call that like a faith crisis or or a transition or anything like that. Really, what I was doing is I was examining two different parts of the cult, and yeah, yeah. and one of them looked like it had more answers than the other, right? And yeah. so I, okay. I, I hopped over to that one because it seemed like it aligned more with what I like. There, there was a, there was specifically this this scripture that I found in the in what's called the Doctrine and Covenants. Yeah. which is this basically this book of revelation. So Joseph Smith would spontaneous 
spontaneously speak for God. And then he would write down what it is. And he put all that into a book called The Doctrine and Covenants. And in that book, the, one of the big questions, one of the big kind of controversies between LDS church and Mormon polygamy is this question of, of authority or priesthood. So who, so when Joseph Smith uh, restored Christ church, they believe that he restored, that God came and gave Joseph Smith the authority to do that. And so only their church is valid, right? Because, right. and so there's this big, there's this big question about who has the authority in that. And in the scripture in Doctrine and Covenants, which I was examining because I, I was dating this woman who was LDS and we were trying to decide, or are we going to be polygamous? Or are we going to be LDS? And so I was examining that really, really closely. And I found this scripture that said, uh, the exact quote is something like, and the, which priesthood of God remaineth with the church for all time. And in the, in the way that they understood that they called the LDS church, the church, and then they called themselves, the AUB called themselves the priesthood. And so they were like, they're, they've been separated. And when I read that, I was like, oh, Joseph Smith said, right, this original founding guy, who's basically like Jesus, he said that the priesthood and the church were inseparable. So if that's the case, then the church is the place for me. So I joined the LDS church and I was LDS for, uh, for five years. And the first big thing that happened that made me kind of start to question that is that I had an experience where I got, I got really, really sick for... Uh, I got like the flu and I, I I had trouble keeping water down for about four or five days. And then I had a bit of a, I had a bit of a psychotic break. So my brain kind of shut down. I, I was hallucinating and I ended up in the hospital and there was like this, it was, it was really traumatic, but part of that experience, I ended up being okay. Right. They, they got, they figured out what was wrong. They got fluids in me. They got me, they got me some help. But part of what, part of what that experience was that when um, I was kind of starting to deteriorate and I was starting to kind of like get a little bit trippy, uh, they called the, my, my wife at the time, she called the bishop over and he called the stake president. And those are both the, the local leaders of the church. And they both came and put their hands on me and they used the priesthood to try and cast a devil out of me because they thought I was possessed. And what I really was is severely dehydrated. Like I hadn't peed for three days. And so when I recovered from that and I was told what had happened, I was like, wait a minute. We believe that this priesthood thing is the power of God. It's basically a bat phone to God. And when they came over to me, rather than God telling them, hey, this guy needs a, some water, give him some water. They thought this guy's possessed by a demon and tried to cast it out. And so I was like, oh, I don't think this is real the way that I thought it was real. Right. Mm. Because mm -hmm. if it were real, the way that I was told that it was real, right? If there was really a thing that was priesthood and that really was the power of God and that really gave the person who had the priesthood a heightened spiritual awareness that God can, could communicate through him, that would have resulted in that person when he touched me, channeling God, immediately identifying the correct problem. Right. right. Because what, right. what's the point of having a bat phone to God if it's inaccurate, <laughs> right? right? Why would you, why would you have that? And so at that point I was like, oh, this is different than I thought. So I started to, I started to sort of, but I was also surrounded, like my, my entire extended family was Mormon. My wife was Mormon. My, like they, I was enmeshed in this world. And so I started to just try to, I, I started to sort of interpret what things a little bit more metaphorical. So I was kind of like, I, was, I became more nuanced. I wasn't taking things literally. I was thinking, oh, there's, there's, you know, maybe all religion is kind of like this. It's all sort of mythical. And, you know, it's, it's about really just trying to be a good person. And these are stories that we're telling ourselves to sort of help us do that. And as I started to kind of engage in, in the church that way, um, I started to see things that they were doing and thinking, oh, this isn't, this isn't okay. Right. Because I now am not seeding my entire world into that, whatever you tell me is true, I'm going to now start to question that. And the thing that was immediate, immediately apparent to me was the way that women were treated. Because I, I came from this background where women were very disempowered. And when I looked around at the LDS church, what I saw was, I mean, the, the, the daily lived experience was better than, than what it was in Mormon polygamy. But in terms of the actual power dynamic, it was exactly the same. Because in the LDS church, women are not given the priesthood, men are. And that's true in polygamy as well. And so 
if you if you are engaged in a system like that where you're empowering one gender and you're not empowering the other gender you're just creating you're creating the patriarchy right you're creating a system that is not going to be good for men or for women right and so i saw that and i i had two daughters and i was just like oh, i don't love this and so there was a um there was a uh, a woman whose name was Kate Kelly and she was a member of the LDS church and she was she started a movement called ordain women and she basically was saying hey women in the LDS church we would like to be ordained we would like to get the priesthood currently that's not allowed so they petitioned the leader of the church the prophet of the church to basically go ask god if that could happen right mm -hmm. they'd already done that right they'd already changed policy like in 1978 when they said actually no if you are from of african descent you can now have the priesthood again they've they've done that before right so he was basically saying go ask right go ask god and they wouldn't even meet with her they wouldn't listen to her and then so then she was like well let's get a group of people to go to the general conference there's a there used to be a general conference meeting where there was uh an all-male priesthood session Mm -hmm. As part of their, they every they have a semi-annual, so it's like every two, every six months they have a big meeting, and there was one meeting that was exclusively for men, and and she went, she got a bunch of people to kind of go, not pick it, but basically stand stand outside of that building and try to get invited in, and they got denied, and they were basically saying, hey, like we want to be here, right? We want to we want to see it, and the LDS Church excommunicated her. Yeah. Oh wow. And when they excommunicated her, they also excommunicated a guy named John DeLynn, who I had never heard of, but he had a, he had a podcast called Mormon Stories. And in, in that podcast, he interviews a ton of people who have exited the church. And it's a lot of it revolves around some of the, uh, some of the truth claims that the LDS church makes that are demonstrably false. So one example, Cam, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this from the, the, the study that you've done is that. Uh, the LDS Church Mormonism has a, a book of scripture called the Pearl of Great Price, which purports to be the, uh, uh, something that Joseph Smith translated from Egyptian papyri and is the mm -hmm. book of Abraham. And that's what Joseph Smith said. So when Joseph Smith was alive, he acquired these Egyptian mummies and these Egyptian papyri, and then he translated from them and he wrote the book of Abraham. We have those papyri. They have been read by Egyptologists. They are not the book of Abraham. It's right. it's a it's a pagan funeral ritual manual. Yeah. It's actually really really standard. It's like a really yeah, standard. standard. It's like it's, it's like what people would be buried with in Egypt. Well, and the Kinderhook plates as well. Yeah, the Kinderhook plates is another example where where someone else made a, some scriptures like the gold plates and brought them to him and was like, "Hey, are these like translate these?" And he translated some of them and they were fake. So there were a number of things like that. There are multiple first vision accounts. There are, uh, there are, um, there's the, the book of Abraham. There's the claim that, that native Americans are descended from Jews and there's zero DNA evidence of that at all. Um, yeah, that's so that, funny. That's a thing too. Um, so there's, all there's right. this, yeah, it, of things, and there are things that I had never even been aware of, right? They, they, these, these are things that, that were kept so secret in Mormonism, you did not talk about them. And if anyone talked about them, they were immediately labeled anti-Mormon, right? That's an anti-Mormon yep. lie, right? Again, going back to information control and thought control. Right. Not to mention all the edits in Joseph Smith's translations. Right. Yeah. So they and they've changed them as they as they've gone along, right? So that that I I didn't I wasn't even aware of that. Right. So I, I then, so I didn't even know about John DeLynn until I hear that he's getting excommunicated with his Kate Kelly. And so then I'm like, who's this John DeLynn guy? And I Google him and I kind of, I start to listen to a lot of, uh, a lot of those podcasts and I start to listen to understand where some of these, these issues. And I'm like, oh, this is all a lie, right? Like this yeah. is a lie. Joseph Smith was lying. He was yeah. not telling the truth. He, he, about any of this. And the, the thing that was sort of the, there, there was a while there where I was like, well, maybe again, because still my entire family was a part of that. At this point, my wife at the time, she, she and I were on the same page about that. We were kind of like exit. We were both going to the Kate Kelly things together. And then when we, we kind of found out about this thing together. And so we were, we were kind of exiting together, but all of our family was still LDS. I was still in Utah, right? I was still employed at a place where 90% of the people were Mormon. And so it was, 
you know, th there was a there was a big part of me that was like, well, maybe I can just stay here, right? Maybe maybe even though it was a lie, maybe it's an okay place to be, right? Maybe the, it's my community. I maybe I can that. be a part of this. Maybe I can help kind of liberalize it. Maybe I can help be part of the change in this organization. Then it can become a more loving and 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 and, uh, and, and a safer place. And then I read uh, some essays that were published by the LDS Church as a response to a lot of these truth claims. So for a long, for the longest time, the LDS church just said, no, these things are not true. These are lies, blah, blah, blah. But then it, it got to the point where there was, it was impossible for them to do that anymore. And so they published on their website, a series of essays explaining each one, right? So it's like, there's an essay on the book of Abraham. And they're like, this is why the book of Abraham, even though it was a Egyptian funeral mummery text, it's actually okay because Joseph Smith just used that to like channel the book of Abraham um, kind of as like a spiritual inspiration. Uh, and so the book of Abraham is still scripture, even if it didn't come in the same way that we sort of thought that it did, right? It's it's their, their, their attempt at apologetics. And in one of those essays, uh, it's an essay called, you can actually go and look it up. You can find it on the, it's on the LDS Church's website right now. And it is an essay about uh, polygamy. And it's an, it's called Polygamy in Kirtland and Nauvoo. And in it, one of the things that, that the LDS Church has kept under wraps for the longest time is that Joseph Smith married teenage girls. Mm -hmm. Right? And uh, I did not know that growing up. Right. I knew about polygamy. I knew about You didn't even know that then? I didn't even know that in 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 polygamy. No, that was not Warren true. Jeffs would probably tell his people that though. Warren Jeffs would definitely tell his people that. Yeah. I, I the 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 sort of the more liberal versions of Mormon polygamy, I, they kind of want to keep it under wraps because they don't want to be associated with that. Rightfully so, because it's pedophilia, right? Yeah. And so um in that essay, they acknowledge it, right? They say, yes, this happened. And Rather than do what the, the rather than do the very easy thing to do, which is and the right thing to do, which is to say that was wrong, yep, we yep. disavow that practice. Right. The only responsible response to the revelation that the founder of your religion was a pedophile is to say that was wrong. We unequivocally dis disavow that. Right. Because yeah. that sets the tone within the organization that other people can't pull on that, right? Because there are men in positions of leadership all the way down this chain in this organization that claims 14 million members who could use that as, hey, like Joseph Smith did this. Hey, girl, like, like this is just like Joseph Smith, right? And who do do that, right? So they, they not only do they fail to say that, but what they actually say in that essay is they say there's a line in there and, and that line just stuck. And this was the thing I was like, I cannot be part of this anymore. And it says that Joseph Smith married Helen Mar Kimball several months before her 15th birthday. Gross. Which to me Gross, was yeah. so disgusting. I'm like, I'm like, you guys, the issue wasn't that she was 15, right? 15 isn't better. <laughs> It's not like if it's not like if she was 16 that I would have been like, yeah, it's totally okay for a 37-year-old man to marry a 16-year-old girl because he told uh, her that an angel would kill him if he didn't. Oh, come on. That's okay, right? That's What fun. a bastard. I'm sorry. What a bastard. A hundred percent, right? <sighs> Awful, right? That's the appropriate response to that, right? Yeah. And when the LDS church failed to do that. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm out. I will not be party. I will not be connected. I will not have any connection to an organization that does not, that, that doesn't take this shit seriously, right? Right. Because you cannot, you cannot let something like that go without, like, not only without denouncing it, but with uh, explaining it away in such a disgusting way. So she was 14. She wasn't sev several months shy of 15 is 14 and 14 isn't better than 15. No, it's not. Not even a it's, little bit. Well, I mean, and it's like, how do you hand wave that away when that's what Warren Jeffs is in prison for? Yes. And he, yeah. I think the girl is actually, I think the girls may have been actually 15. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how are you, how are you? I'm oh, sorry. It's sort of like, it's sort of like it gives people like that their permission. It says, okay, here's the line. A few right. months before 15, 15 is the line. Right. Like, right. Ew. Grody.
Yeah, and the LDS Church today would say they would say, well, you know, we don't we don't allow that at all. Okay, that's fine, but you have a system in place where that allows that puts men in positions of authority and has them interview children about their sexual habits. So, in that system, you cannot allow any room for that dude to say, "Do you know that Joseph Smith married?" And I've actually, the Lord has come to me and he's told me that you, like you're, you're creating a scenario where grooming is going to happen. And I'm sorry, you have to be held, especially if you're an organization that claims tax exempt status and has a hundred billion dollars of liquid assets. I expect you to be held to a higher standard. Under no circumstances, when a girl is 15 years of age, an adult man comes to her, even if he's not having sexual relations with her until after she turns 18. If you're approaching this young girl and preempting her for the idea that she's going to be your wife and your sexual partner at 15 years of age, you're a pedophile and you're a groomer. I don't care if you don't touch her until she's 18 years old. You're a groomer. You should be fired out of a cannon into the sun. Right. And that, that kind of response is the only ethical response to something like that. Right. And when they failed to respond that way, I was like, I'm out and I'm going to spend the rest of my life making fun of you in public yeah. so that people see how much, how big of bastards you are. That's the only way to respond to anybody who thinks that's okay. Uh, Especially right. if your excuse is, well, in our religion, we get married young. Yeah, you're in trouble with me and yeah. I am going to mock and degrade you for the rest of my earthly existence. Exactly. That's the only appropriate Can- thing to do. Can yeah. I say I'm a little bit jealous of you, Ben? Because <sighs> I have been in on shows i've talked to people online in different ways and i've made fun of these mormon beliefs in different ways and people are always like no no no, don't be mean to the mormons i love the mormons and i'm like i'm not talking about people you like i'm talking about mormonism but i I can't get away with it and you can i have i have i i'm come from a very special background where i'm very (laughs) i'm very qualified to critique the system and I'm so jealous because it's like all the things you've said, I like, with the exception of the spirit blood, that's new for me. But other than that, I'm like, I know all of this stuff and I want to make fun. And it's right. like every time I do, it's like, oh, but, you know, the Mormons, they, if you want to buy food, bulk food for in case, you know, the EMP hits, you know, you got to be nice to them. And <laughs> I'm like, to. no, you don't understand what I know. Right. I always I, talk I, I like to when distinguish he... when I talk about this, I, I try to distinguish between Mormons and Mormonism. Right. right. That, that to me, I that I think I'm I'm very intentional. Like I I want I'm intentionally trying to take down a cult that has harmed me and mm-hmm. everyone that I've loved and everyone that I've known for generations and is and continues to harm children and innocent people. So I'm like that's like my life's mission. So underneath like the comedy and the fun and all of that, there's there's a that like that I was raised to be a prophet and to fight evil. And when I came of age and I looked around the planet, I saw evil and it was that, right? right. That's Mormonism though, right? Mormonism right. is a, is a, it's a worldview. It's a cult. It's this thing that is grabbed onto people and is making them do things that they wouldn't no- otherwise do, right? And I like to distinguish that from Mormonism, but from yeah. Mormons, Mormons are people. Mormons are lovely people. They're kind. They deeply care about what is right. And they have been lied to not only sometimes for their entire life, sometimes for generations of their family, they have been lied to. Yeah. Well, and and, and that's the thing. I try to make this point, but it's like I'm being, I have a biblical studies degree. I'm just not allowed. I'm just right. not allowed. Um, Every time Cam starts in on the Mormons, I say, say what you will about the Mormons. They give a hell of a Christmas concert. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, no, I'm talking about the ism, not the people. Mm-hmm. They're right, great. Right. But it's like, ugh. Um, I want to tell you, though, maybe you'll imp- appreciate this. Um, early on when I started making this show, there is a an episode titled Ordering Mormons. Mm-hmm. And the reason <laughs> this, the it's called that is because my favorite, one of my favorite pranks is to order some Mormons. <laughs> and so so what I've done, uh, I did it to a one of my wife's family members. I did it to a girl that I worked with that was particularly annoying. All you had to do, and COVID kind of ruined this, yeah. Uh, but all you have to do is go to the Latter-day Saints website, mm-hmm. order a, a, a Book of Mormon, and ask for the 
the missionaries Elders to come see you yeah. and they get Mormon. They get, they, they get, get Mormon. <laughs> they get oh my Mormon. God. That is <laughs> such a good prank. <laughs> it's so good because, because they always report back and you have to sit there and not laugh until they walk away because right. they're like, I keep getting, I keep getting calls from Mormons. I have Mormons come to my house. I have this book that I didn't order. And you're just sitting there like, <laughs> so I had, I had Mormons come to my house one time and it was the middle of January. It was frigid <laughs> outside. And it was these two very young men came to my yeah. door and I was like, Oh my God, you poor babies. It's freezing outside. Come in here and let me give you some cocoa. They're like, no, ma'am, we can't come in your house. One time a lady kidnapped some Mormons and kept them in her basement for a year. Oh, and I was God. like, what? <laughs> totally true story. Some woman, these young, they're, they're like 18, these kids. They're babies, they, send them, yeah. they send them to people's houses. And this lady was like, well, come into my house, innocent young men. And she kept them in her basement. So, God knows what she did to them. Oh, poor guys. Yeah, so I know. when you do, when you order some Mormons as a prank, make sure you're not ordering them for a psychopath. Right. Make sure right. You're, you're going to a nice place. What's what's funny yeah. about all of that? So that's a hilarious prank, and I I I you should continue to do it because it's very funny. Um, but what the, the underlying thing that's interesting to me about that is that the like so Mormons. The reason that's funny, right, is because Mormon missionaries are fucking annoying. Yeah. Right? Nobody wants the missionaries to show up to that because they're annoying, and that's actually part of the tactic, right? The the Mormon mission isn't designed to convert other people. That's sometimes a nice benefit as it does grow numbers, especially in developing countries, which is <laughs> again, deeply problematic. <laughs> that a cult Sorry. is sending, uh, it's basically sending white people into Africa and young, Africa, young and people, potentially attractive, potentially attractive to, to basically recruit vulnerable people for their cult. Uh, but part of the reason that it's designed that way is it's actually designed to, uh, it's a it's a retention tactic within the cult. So okay. the experience that the Mormon child, the Mormon kid has is, you get ready to go on your mission. You're told your whole life that it's going to be the best thing that's ever happened. God is going to call you to some cool place. When you're leaving, your entire ward turns out and they honor you. They send you off in this really grand fashion, and then you go out into the world and you get rejected and laughed at. Oh. And all of these things, right? Because you're, because you're just 18. like polygamy is hard, right? You're 18 and you're walking and you're annoying, right? No one likes an 18 year old who's walking around like, I know how the world works. <laughs> and so we make fun of them. And then their experience of that is persecution. And then right. they come back after two years of persecution, they come back home where they're welcomed into the fold. They're, they're greeted as heroes and they're welcomed back into this safe place. And then they never leave because the experience that they had of the outside world was rejection, persecution, and they've been vindicated, right? Their 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 beliefs yeah. have been vindicated. All wow, I didn't know that, and that's fascinating. But also, I'm telling you, if you ever want to prank someone, dude, order <laughs> some Mormons. Totally, it's great. It's a phenomenal <laughs> prank. They've designed it so well. They've made it. You can do it online. There's basically an app for it. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> when I when I when I finally got to the point where I didn't have to call, I was so thrilled, dude. <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't like, oh hey, I'm blah blah blah. It was like, oh, I'm just gonna type this in and they show up. Oh. Uh, but you say, you know, they ha they have this persecution in the outside world. But I'm curious, once you hit the outside world, once you started experiencing the world as we Jessica and I have experienced it essentially our whole lives. Mm -hmm. What were your what were the things that surprised you? What were the things that your takeaways? What has been good and bad, et cetera? Yeah. So the the most surprising thing to me was how nice everyone was. Hmm. Right? Because I was raised to believe that the world was wicked. And it turns out it's it's not. Right? Like there are there are definitely there are definitely, yeah, there are definitely problems. There are definitely, you know, some people are some people are assholes. Um, yeah. but by and large, the response that I've had, like when I interact with people is and people are lovely, right? This world is lovely. Um, the things that I was raised to, to believe that are evil, right? Rock music and, and Hollywood are beautiful um, uh, expressions of humanity, right? It's, it's the way that we've created beauty and art in, in our world. Um, I'm, I'm just thrilled, right? And I, I kind of joke about it a lot. So I, I tell people that they're heathens. I talk about how I'm out here experiencing wickedness and wickedness for me is like making out. 
Um, <laughs> like super wicked. Seeing elbows is really wicked for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because I, I was raised to believe that all of these things were were all of these things that are very just much a part of the human experience are actually were actually bad, and so I'm able to kind of rediscover those now, right? I'm right. I'm I'm being able to sort of engage in the world from a place of delight and wonder rather than fear and and like righteous judgment. Right. 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 So, what were your favorite first things? Like, let's say movies or music. What's like the what was the first thing that you watched or listened to? Once you felt like the you were out of the yoke and you could. Oh, my favorite, my favorite, uh, my favorite band that I've listened to is this guy. His name is Radical Face, or his stage name is Radical Face. His name is Ben Cooper, um, and I discovered him right as I was leaving uh, Mormonism, and he. He is a, 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 a gay man from the South and he was kind of kicked out of his parents' home when he was like 15. And, mm -hmm. and so his, and he, has, he sings these really lovely lyrical songs and his stories about what it means to be in a family and kind of rejected by a family really spoke to me on yeah. the journey that I was on. And so I, I love okay. that. Um, my favorite thing, kind of the first really, really big thing that I did that was against what I was raised to, to believe is I went to, um, I went to Uganda when I was 18 and I spent an entire, I, I spent an entire summer in Uganda. And I mean, these were people that I was raised to believe were never going to go to heaven. They were like, they, they had been cursed because of, you know, they were, uh, they weren't worthy in the preexistence. And I spent an entire summer in their world. And I was like, these are, these are people. They're just like me. They, and in so many ways, they're better than me. And so uh, I think the biggest gift that I found through that and kind of discovering that is that I, I was raised in a worldview that was very exclusive, right? It said that there were this many people who were going to go to heaven. And in that sense, all of humanity was stolen from me, right? <clears throat> what I've been able to find is actually all of humanity is mine. Everyone right. Is my people. I'm. I was raised to believe I was part of the chosen people. That's bullshit. Everyone is the chosen people. I am a part. I, I'm a part of this of this of this human world, and I get to be a part of it, right? And I get to be a part of it um, in a way that I think is is really unique because I know what it's like to not be part of it. Yeah. I know what it's like to believe that it is bad. I know what it's like to believe that it's going to be over and that that's going to be a good thing. And now I get to experience it from the perspective of oh, isn't this lovely? Yeah. Well, I mean, in a very yeah. minor way, very much, much more minor way. It's like um, when, like my mom, she loved Led Zeppelin mm -hmm. when she was a teenager. That was when she did her, her cocaine and her, her drinking and her, her sinning. That's and when and Cindy, never. <laughs> and then she, you know, she became a Christian and she, I never listened to Led Zeppelin oh. at all in my life. And then I think I hit, I was probably in college. So probably like 19 or 20, I grabbed um, Zoso, the, the fourth album. <laughs> and it was like listening to heaven. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, this is what I was missing. And yeah. I'm like, man, I wish I was in the 70s. Oh, so no. much good stuff out of them. So much good stuff. I, I, that's, I love that story. Like that's, that's the experience, right? Of being, of, there's something lovely about stepping out into a world that you thought was wicked and finding yeah. that it's actually wonderful. And right? I do think the music's wonderful, but I think Jimmy Page is a little sus. I don't know who Jimmy Page is. <laughs> Jimmy Page is the their leads. guitarist. Right. And like, he was like an Aleister Crowley. I don't know if you know who that is. I don't like know who that cultist. is. You, you explain, you explain something Man. that I didn't know by explaining it. Because our culture is so, it's know. reference upon reference to other references. So a lot of right. times I'm sure people are talking and you're like, I don't let know me, what you're talking let about. Let me kind of bring you up to speed on where I am, Cam. Yes. Last night, I learned that Led Zeppelin wasn't a person. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, okay. So let, let oh, me I want to hang out with you every day. Let, let me explain <laughs> what I mean. So Jimmy Page was the guitarist of Led Zeppelin. Okay. He was big into Aleister Crowley, who was an occultist who was big into what's the other, no, it's Aleister Crowley who, and this was the one that this was the guy who kind of came up with the um, do what thou wilt kind of Satanist line of things and apparently did some stuff to young, 
people. And so there's this, there's kind of this grandfatherdom of ickiness in yeah. the background, yeah. but it's like, but still like that, that first track black dog on four by Led Zeppelin is a mm -hmm. magical song that I get excited about every time I hear it. <laughs> well, and I, I actually, I had a, a really lovely experience in, in the, just the last couple of months where I, I went to uh, sort of this kind of festival where, where there was this woman who was singing and she's very kind of like on, on the, what, what I think most people in society would consider the fringe of the spiritual movement, right? Like mm -hmm. um, new age, like hippie, like all, all like just a phenomenal person, but like out there. Yeah. And she uh, had created these these songs that she called worship songs, right? And so she was singing them, and I I felt this feeling inside where I was like, "Oh, this is worship. This is what it means to worship, right?" And it was like so overpowering. I actually like I knelt down and I was like, I was like, "This is the thing that I always wanted to feel, but I never did." Mm -hmm. And, I, and when I felt it, I was like, this, this really is just, and it was just this lovely song about breath, right? About, about how breath is now, about how we are now, right? And it was like, oh, this is worship. Like this is, and this is a very human thing, right? Worship is a very human thing. And I want to live in a world where I experience the great creative arts and music, I think is such an, an integral part of that. And the, the experience that I have from that isn't, that's wicked. But that is worship. Yeah. Right. Right. So it's interesting to me it, when I'm hearing you talk about coming sort of into the world for the first time and experiencing it reminds me very much of how, you know, when it rains for a really long time and the sky is gray for a really long time, you start to live in that world where the mm -hmm. sky is just gray. Totally. And so when it clears up and you see that blue sky, even though you know blue sky was there you knew you would see it again. It's like you're seeing it for the first time and it is mm -hmm. so beautiful. Yeah. And it just sort of, um, I, I'm envious of this um, love and romance that you get to have with the world. Mm -hmm. That it, it is this sort of like a new love. And that's yeah. so beautiful. That's such a beautiful description of what it's like to be me. Like one of the things that I'm there, there were, there were a lot of things about my childhood that were not ideal. Right. And I've done a, a significant yeah, yeah. amount of healing from that, but mm -hmm. what that's enabled me to do and to be is this, is this sort of fresh face in the world where everything's new to me. Right. Right. And it's not that like, as I've been out, I've, I've done things, right. I've experienced things. I've, I've like, it's not like, it's not like every day I'm doing something new, but, but I've also sort of learned this orientation of, I know how how precious it really is because I've seen, I, it's been kind of hidden from me for so long. And it's one of like, I wouldn't change that for anything, right? The, the way that I get to experience the world and the way that I get to see the world. And then hopefully the way that I get to share that experience with other people to sort of remind them that, that, that that's the way that we all can experience the world. Yeah. Right. right. We can all experience it from this place of like gratefulness and wonder and freshness, because the reality is, None of us have tried everything. Yeah. None of us have watched all the movies. None of us right. have listened to all the songs. None of us, none of us have had all of the experiences, but we kind of think that we have, right? We're like, oh, we've figured it out. Like we, you get, you get sort of into your thirties and your forties and you kind of like solidify and you're like, I've done all the things. Yeah. No, you haven't. Yeah. There are plenty of things you haven't done. Okay. And if you can approach that from this place of wonder and delight and curiosity, rather than I already know what I like, I already know what's true right. and good. And I just have kind of an, an advantage in that because I was raised to believe that everything was wrong. And so now everything's great. Well, it, it reminds me of like um, people who were in those horribly oppressive communist countries who had to wait in bread lines or look at, you know, aisles that were empty. And then they walk into a Walmart, mm -hmm. a Walmart, not a, not a pretty place, a yeah. Walmart for the first time. And it's like walking into the Garden of Eden. Right. Totally. Right. And so there's this gratefulness that you that you get to experience that not a lot of us get to. And that's really cool. And it's like, I just wish it wasn't balanced against, you know, a more Mormon polygamist cult. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, the universe wanted a bend, so it made one. Right? Yeah. It made the only way that it knew how, which was it dropped me in the middle of a Mormon polygamist cult. And it was like, fuck around and find out. And I did. <laughs> I it, it really, go ahead. No, go ahead. 
I was going to say in a really cool way, you kind of get to be your own kid. Um, totally. And I mean that by like, we introduce our children to the world and we get to see them experience things for the first time. And that reminds us of our, ourselves experiencing for the first time. You get to do that with yourself. I get to do that with me. As an adult. Yeah, right. That's, it's really magic. People wish for that. They're like, how can I get that magic of childhood back? How do I get that that wonder and awe that I used to feel, but I'm such a jaded and cynical adult now that I can't get back to that feeling? And mm -hmm. like, um, you have an endless supply of that. Yeah, and, the answer um, is I'm so out with jealous. Me. Come <laughs> hang out with me, right? I'll, I was like, I'll I'm gonna hang out with you every day. <laughs> well, Sundays he 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 watches new movies and new things that people from TikTok That's suggest. True. Okay. This is brilliant, by the way, because it's you so are opening a window so that the rest of us get to have a little taste of yeah. what you have. And that's wonderful. Thank you it's, for that. It's really, really fun. So I, I watched uh, I watched Labyrinth last week. I watched Goonies the week before that. Um, and the first one that I did was Breakfast Club, which oh wow was so good. I loved it so much. <laughs> it was so fun. <laughs> and amazing. what's funny is like... I. Have you watched Indiana Jones yet? I have, yes. Oh my, like, let me tell you, if you didn't have that as a kid, like, that was everything I wanted out of life. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> or Back to the Future. The whip. <laughs> have you watched Tombstone yet? Um, I don't know. Is it a cowboy Western? movie? Yeah. It's a, it's a Western. Yeah. It's got Val Kilmer playing Doc Holliday. He's. I immortal in that role i think i have i think i watched that pretty pretty soon after i left but i don't remember is it he's got like two guns and he's like oh, yeah oh, i mean he's he's legendary in that movie yeah. give that another run now I'll, that you've been I'll out give a another, while i'll give yeah. another watch yeah. through yeah because <laughs> that's, that's just... probably my favorite movie scratch that who's afraid of virginia wolf is my favorite movie but yeah, secondary seen... oh man Put that on your list, please, because okay. that movie rocks my socks. I watched that one together. That movie. It's so good. Going. We should just watch that together, guys, because I've never yes. seen that. <gasps> Let's do is. that as a Patreon event where we watch uh, <laughs> Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Because that movie's so good. <laughs> I'm down. That sounds so fun. <laughs> ah. um, I don't want to keep you for too long because we do go long on this show when we're having good conversations. But yeah. I do have one question that I want to ask from these – the standpoint of a man who is married to a woman and I have five children, mm -hmm. the idea of having more than one wife, my mind, that sounds like complete. Like, I feel like I have panic attacks now. What the hell would I do then? Because it seems like no matter what, you're going to have jealousy. You're going to have envy. You're going to have these issues. Yep. People try to dress yep. it up. And it's, it's funny because like, if you watch sister wives, you see them dress it up like rhetorically and then you're watching it and you're going, these people are falling apart. Right. So uh, what my, is that like? I just, I just, my, I need to. Specifically, I want to address the idea of like, um, nobody wants to be the first wife. Yeah. In so, that show yeah. that, yeah. I'll kind of, I'll kind of hit the, the dynamics and then I'll talk just personally. Right. So the dynamics are, yeah, the first wife is considered the, no one wants to be the first wife. No one wants to be the second wife either. The best wife is the third wife. And that's what Chris that's the hot Steen young wife right said, I think. She was like, I always wanted to be a third wife. And the idea there is right that the first wife, the, the second wife, when they when they join, there's tons of conflict. Sure. Right. And so they kind of like all of the all, all of it gets kind of meted out between those three. And then by the time the third wife joins, it's it's already kind of happened once. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that's that's one way to look at it. I I suspect that every time a new wife is added, there are that it disrupts the entire dynamic. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you, it's basically every time that is introduced, you have, the, there's a whole reshuffling that goes on in because there's, especially she, if she's she younger, younger, especially if she's younger. Yeah. Was she, was she, was she always is right. Because that's you, you, there. It's very, very rare that a later, that another, that another wife is, is older. Right. You're almost always adding new younger ones. Right. So that's sort of the way that di the di dynamic works out. That's one of the reasons why I don't think that uh, polygamy is a healthy lifestyle to raise children in, because what often happens that, that that dynamic, right, that tension between the parents, it either sometimes it can't help but be discharged down onto the kids. 
So I became, in a very real sense, I became the punching bag for my other mom because she didn't mm-hmm. feel like she could take that out on my, like, could, because they were supposed to be sister wives, oh, right? Damn. And so I, as the oldest child, absorbed a lot of that, right? And my mm-hmm. sister, who's just younger than me, who's also my mom's, she feels the same way. And and so, you know, that's not a healthy environment to to raise children in, right? Because children require a lot of care. And they require, in order to raise a healthy child, right, you have to be able to, as an adult, sort of set your emotional needs aside and care for the emotional needs of the child, right? Yeah. So you don't go, a good healthy parent doesn't go to the kid and say, hey, I need some, I need some, some support from you. I need, no, no, no. Our job is to hold that container, right? Um, right. And in Mormon polygamy, they're, you're so overcharged that you often can't do that. So right. you're emotionally unavailable. Um you know, the, the relationships are often exploitative and just, just very unhealthy. So that's the sort of my, my answer to that dynamic cam to kind of address your, your kind of point in question. I agree entirely. And in fact, one of the, when I was describing sort of like that, that disconnect between what I was raised to believe was right. And what felt good in my body. One of the things that didn't feel good in my body, my entire life was I never wanted to have multiple wives. The idea of, of being a plural of a, of a husband in polygamy to me felt incredibly isolating because the mm-hmm. men are taught, look, you have to keep wives' confidences from each other. And so oh. what that means as a man is there's never going to be someone with whom you can be entirely vulnerable and intimate because you're mm-hmm. always going to have walls. Yep. You're always going to have segments of your life that you do not share with that person. And so as a polygamist husband, you are never fully authentic and fully vulnerable with anyone. And that sounded awful to me. Yeah. You know, we often frame the, what the problem with polygamy in terms of the women. Mm -hmm. And we don't think at all about how it's a problem for the men. So I'm kind of glad that you addressed that because I think they kind of get left out of the picture in this. I think it's worth, worth talking about because I, I think that there, I think that the, the narrative is often Oh, well, he just wants, he just wants more wives, right? It's it's often, it's often painted in men want more sex. And so obviously men want this. And, (laughs) and my experience of it is that, that, that is not the case for most men, right? That most, most, that almost all, and there are definitely, there are definitely the Warren Jeffs of the group, right? There are predators who get into the community and use it to prey on people a hundred percent, but most men are not predators, most men are are sensitive, are emotional, have have a, a very rich and unexpressed emotional world, and they are severely isolated in Mormon polygamy. Hmm. Right. I, I think that is it. I think that it is incredibly hard to be a, a polygamist husband. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I I'm I'm thinking of it in terms of even you know lack of knowledge, but I mean the idea of having to please one woman, and I don't just mean sexually, I mean in right. all the ways. To emotions is, care for. Yeah, it's daunting. It, mm-hmm. And that's just one woman. Yeah. And could you I, I cannot imagine a world in which I have to please three, four women. Like right. I mean, I love women. That's the best thing God ever did. But God, I'd rather not live in a house with with four of them that I have that much responsibility for. <laughs> right, and and it's 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 not even like what how I would respond to that is it's because caring for another person, caring for the emotional needs of another person, requires a lot of attention. Yeah, mm-hmm. it just mm-hmm. does, right? If you're going to do it well, and you know if if you feel like you have to do that in in Imagine you have to do that to five people to the level that you do it with your spouse. That's a lot of energy. Yeah. Well, not to mention that when you're to adequately please make happy, provide for one woman, it takes a hundred percent of you. Right. Like it, like I have to think about my wife constantly all day. Mm -hmm. I'm always thinking about her. How could I, how could I think of even one more woman right. in that way? Yeah, I don't think it's possible. Yeah. And how, I mean, the, the, the sister wives love to have this, this kind of saying, they'll say, love it. We don't believe love is divided. Love is multiplied. Right. But here's the reality. 
time is not multiplied. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Energy is not multiplied. Yeah. So you are now having to care for the emotional needs of more people. And, and that means that you're caring for the needs of people with a, with a finite and decreasing resource, which is time and energy. Yeah. It just well, is the way that it is. Well, and it's, it's, that's true. So I like the, the, before the sister wives, the love is multiplied only made sense to me in the, in the way of children. Mm -hmm. Like if I have three children rather than two, I love them all the same. And that makes, that, that makes sense. I just love, I have more to love. Right. Um, but I can also play the same games with them at the same time and mm -hmm. everyone be happy. The games that you play as a married man with your wife, you cannot yeah. do with all of them at the same time and keep them all happy. No, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> so I don't want to try. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny. And also it's, it's true, right? Like that, that is, it, it creates, it creates scenarios for people where they are trying to meet needs that they don't have the, that, 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 that it's just really difficult to, right? I, yeah. I remember as a, as a boy believing that I was going to be required to have multiple wives and thinking that does not sound fun to me. Yeah. Mm -mm. And you had it firsthand. Like I remember when I was a little boy and I was like, Oh, multiple girls, that sounds cool. And then I, I think I hit 17 and I, I had my first girlfriend. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I couldn't do this. <laughs> Right. <laughs> More than one. I can, this was a silly thing for a child to think. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's so fascinating. I, I honestly, I could do an entire different episode just talking about everything you've experienced and all of that. I'm just thrilled to be talking to you. I'm um, thrilled to talk to you guys too. This was so much fun. I appreciate it. This is that. really well, an enriching for me because this is a world I'm totally unfamiliar with. And I sort of appreciate that you are so open because oh. um, otherwise I'm left to the presuppositions I can gather from reality TV. And that's just yeah. not the picture, <laughs> you know? That's not, yeah, I, I um, you know, I, I feel really called to be open and to, and to share and, and to do it. In a, and I've also done enough uh, internal work and kind of healing. I've been on enough of that journey where I can do that in a way that that is safe for me. And, right. and so I, I really feel like, um, no one has necessarily asked me to do this, but I feel like I'm the voice for literally thousands of children who were born into environments that they did not ask for and uh, and need someone to to speak for them, right? Yeah. And um, so I'm, I'm, the voiceless. I'm happy to do that, right? Because that there there are it's an it's it's fascinating and it's it it is literally it's captured the attention of millions of Americans, right? Polygamy literally makes hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue in entertainment in books and all of this in the United States today we are fascinated with it and unfortunately most of that money does not go to actually helping people who are truly victims of that yeah right right i have two more on topic questions and then our final question sweet um if i can remember them because i have the worst brain um oh one of them being uh, one of the guys, I think I mentioned him. I don't know if we mentioned him in the episode or if it was before, but there was one guy that I found on TikTok at one point who mm. I think had upwards of 90 siblings. Right. And so, and I, I saw yeah. a couple other people on TikTok who I think that they were, there was much lower than that, but still high. And their dad did not know their names. Mm -hmm. Does your dad know all of you and your siblings names and do they, does he know you well enough at all or so my dad my dad knows who all of us are and he he tried really hard to be a, a good dad um okay. he didn't do he didn't do well with me gotcha um and 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 part of that is because he uh you know the the worldview that he uh adopted allowed like he believed that it was okay to have his children work for him in in a bakery. And so I was labor trafficked for 10 years. Um, mm. and, and the relationship that I had with him was really more of a boss employee relationship and rather than a father son. Okay. Yeah. Um, my second on topic question is, um, do you still talk to any of your siblings or family? Are you still in contact or are you? Yeah, so I, 
I've been, so both of those are true, right? I've, I've been, they, they view me as the lost and fallen one, right? The one who has chosen the, the, the wicked and sinful path. Um, and I haven't done a lot to dissuade them from that because I say fuck in front of them, you know, uh, on purpose all the time. Uh, just to watch and, them. <laughs> well, it's not even to watch them. There is a part of me that likes to just poke people, but it's, it's, it's to, it's to force them to grapple with the reality of me and, mm. and to force them to grapple with the reality of me as I'm doing all of these things that you think are wicked. But when you look at me, do you see that I'm happy? Do you see, do you see me in a way, like, can you see the light in my eyes? Can you see the spring in my step? Can you recognize that I'm not what you were told I would be? Hmm. Right. Um, but so I've been, so that, that did happen, right? I was told I was you know, going to be buffeted by the winds of Satan for all of my life. Uh, 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 among other things. Um, but I've really intentionally tried to maintain a relationship with my, with my parents and, and especially with my siblings because, uh, I was the first to leave and, um, uh, it was really difficult. Yeah. It, it was really difficult to come out and to find my footing in this world to even just do ba- like, I, I, I didn't have a social security number. I didn't have oh, any wow. kind of job experience. Right. I, I had to figure out very, very basic things that uh, most people who are raised in society just take for granted and just understand. Yeah. I didn't know. I had to figure that those things out for myself. Um, and so uh, it was really difficult for me. And so I've, really intentionally maintained a relationship with my parents and with my siblings because I want to be available to them should they decide to exit. Right. And mm-hmm. a couple of them followed me out and I've been able to kind of like grab them in a big, in a big hug and be like, I've got you. I can, I can, I can help you out. Right. I can, I can help you exit this. I can give you the things that you need to get out. Um, and I, you know, I, I hope I've got, you know, uh, I'm the third of 16. So I have, uh, tw- 13, I have 13 younger siblings and, m- you know, a lot of them are still living at home and I, I hope to, I hope to be able to assist them if, if I can. Have, has your essentially twin brother become a polygamist or he, did he, he hasn't that? yet, um, but he is still in the faith. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah. he just hasn't, he hasn't found a second wife yet. Uh, boy, that sounds like it'd be difficult. <laughs> just like on Tinder, but what, what, yeah. let, let, let's. I, I think you can help me with this. Just on I think, polygamy Tinder. <laughs> I think there needs to be a polygamy Tinder. This one has a nice bonnet. <laughs> <laughs> what What would we name the polygamy Tinder app? Oh, Plinder. Plinder. Oh, easy. <laughs> I'm so bummed out. I have a bonnet. I'm so bummed out that I didn't wear it. <laughs> oh, that would have been so perfect. <laughs> I totally got hammered one night and Amazon ordered a bonnet. I don't know why it showed up a couple days later and I'm like, what the fuck is this? Why do I have a bonnet? That sounds like a a good time. (laughs) So I'll ask you our final question that we ask of all of our guests. And then I have to address the, the elephant in the room with Jessica. You don't know this, but there is a ring in my nose that wasn't there last week. And I have to explain that. So you can stick around for that if you'd like. Um, But um, our last question is, especially over the last two years, there've been a lot of depressed people. There've been a lot of people who feel pretty hopeless. And mm-hmm. one of the things we decided to, um, glom onto is we want to help provide people with little bits of hope, little silver linings that can help them mm-hmm. continue and give them motivation to continue on. Yeah. So my question for you is, um, and you, like you can make it personal, global, local, whatever, What's something right now in your life that's giving you hope and helps you carry on that you might share with our audience? I love that question. And I I know exactly how I want to answer it. So I was raised to believe in uh, the imminent second coming of Jesus Christ and the end of the world, right? The apocalypse. Um, I, I did not seriously consider the possibility that I would live past the age of 25 until I was 20. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, it was very hilarious to me that uh, in 2020, we descended into an apocalypse. Right. I was like, damn it. <laughs> uh, did I do that? <laughs> um, here's what I've learned though, right? Uh, 
because we are in a really challenging time as a, as a species, right? It's not just COVID, right? It's, it's climate. It's all of the things like we are, uh, we are living in an, in, in an, in an apocalyptic time. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I've learned about apocalypses is, is that I was raised to understand them incorrectly because an apocalypse is actually an opportunity. An apocalypse simply means if you actually look at the Greek, so you'll know this, an apocalypse is simply an uncovering. A re yeah, revelation. A revelation. And in an apocalypse, what happens is that a, a truth is revealed and the, re the revelation of that truth breaks down the current order. Mm -hmm. Wow, so we, I didn't know are, that. We are in the midst of a number of revealed truths about our society from the way that we handle race in our country, from the way that we handle public health, from the way that we manage our stewardship of this planet. We are being bombarded daily with the, with the results of the revealed truth of that. And that is incredibly painful, right? Anytime a revealed truth that has been hidden comes to light, it is devastating. I know this yeah. personally because uh, I've, I've deconstructed not one, but two different religions. And I can tell you that the devastation of finding that a revealed truth destroys the world that you inhabited is profound, right? There's a reason why people are depressed. It's because we, there's, a, there's a lot to be depressed about, but there's hope in the midst of that, right? Because it's from the sort of chaos, sort of the, the ashes of that revealed truth that something new can be born. And I think we're just in the beginning phases of seeing that. So I actually have a ton of hope for us as humans because we are incredibly clever creatures. We are uh, incredibly adaptive. We have survived so much. And I suspect that we will do the same here and we'll do it in a way to build a better world. So the world that my children is going to are, going, are going to inherit, I think, will be a better world than this one. It will look different. Right? Yeah. We will have to find ways to change how this world is ordered and structured because the current yeah. world does not work. But yeah. we are going to because we are currently bumping up against those limits and they're breaking. And it's from that breakage and that destruction that we're going to have a new world. So I'm, I'm actually incredibly optimistic. What that means, though, is that the next couple of years are going to be pretty hard. Yeah. yeah. You got to put in the work. You, you got to put in the, work. the ground yep, before you plant the seeds. Ground. And, I think that and, might be the best answer we've ever gotten. Oh, man. Well, I just had to go through 25 years of a cult. <laughs> Get there. Seriously, though, like what's great about that is like you're like coming into this world brand new and you and you don't know so many things that I know and you're teaching me. Mm -hmm. And that's awesome. Like it just shows like that our experiences, despite being so different, are so valuable to each other. Yeah, and if there's one thing that I know, it's apocalypses. So don't worry, you guys. <laughs> I trained for the apocalypse my entire life. Uh, we've got this. It's going to be fine. All right. Good deal. Good deal. Yeah. It, it's going to be okay. <laughs> We're going to make it. <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. So, um, do you want to do you want to stick around to the for the elephant in the room? I do actually. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so my wife has been asking me to pierce my septum for years. And I've always said, I don't know. It's not really my, a, a me thing. I mean, I'm, I have a bunch of tattoos as you can see, but mm -hmm. that's not really my thing. I, I let her, I allowed the earring or whatever. And I'm like, I'm not going to go out and spend $60 plus to get someone to shove a needle through my nose, mm -mm. put a ring into it. I'm not going to do it. And she goes, Oh, that's fine. And so are you ready for the, the Halloween portion of this. Um, so she said she would do it. We just need to get the ring and a needle. And then she goes to do it and she can't. Well, She's yeah. incapable of inflicting pain on me. Oh my God. But you know, who's really good at inflicting pain on himself. You did that to yourself. I Pam? did this to myself. Do you know how hard it is? To push a 16 gauge needle through your nose. I'm gonna call <laughs> your mother. I, I can't. I can't. It's, it's so hard. No. <laughs> Let me tell you. And it's not like it's not like so the good the good thing about having paying someone $60 to do it is they just pop it through and you're done. 
It's not possible when you're doing it to yourself. No, sir. Okay. No, because my, I'm like trying to hold on. My nose is going this way as I'm trying to. Horrible. Ah. And so uh, we'll see if it lasts. <laughs> but I mangled myself but I told this him, week. <laughs> what I told him is he either needs to get a small one or like really commit and get a huge one. It can't be like that middle of the ground shit that he's got. Like I agree. Like I would go big. <laughs> Yeah, I think I figure I should I should just get one of those mustache ones that you you feed door through. knocker. You need, you need a full on like door knocker. <laughs> like <laughs> we'll see how this goes, but yeah. So a couple of days ago, I mutilated myself. That if 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 you want to know. Also, Gross. my wife's learning to tattoo, so I have three more tattoos on my thigh that I didn't have a week ago. <laughs> so that's trust. Imagine if you had three wives that you had to let tattoo. Right? Could you imagine that? I have five wives and all of them have a different part of me that they're tattooing. You have 15 <laughs> tattoos on your thigh. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's math. I gave her a tattoo machine for Christmas and I said, you can have a thigh. God bless you. I don't know of any men who would let their wives just draw <laughs> on them. Right. So that's what I'm saying. Oh, three wives? No, sir. Not in this mm-hmm. world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The, the things I have to do for my wives, most, <laughs> most polygamous men uh, just, so maybe you could be a polygamous man. Most polygamous men are not letting their wives tattoo their thighs. That's true. That's true. If you thought that That's was true. a requirement in polygamy, it's actually. <laughs> right, right, right. It's, you mean to tell me that that's not in the Pearl of Great Price? That is not in the Pearl of Great Price. No. <laughs> Which, right. by the way, I can't, I, I, I want to get my hands on the doc- Doctrines and Covenants and the pearl of great price but i wanted to do it for free online they pearl like they are pearl? hard to find mm-hmm. okay yeah you can download they're they're on the church's website so you can read them on well they the they weren't last i checked they just gave you the book of mormon but they may have changed oh, oh i'm talking i'm talking about like the there's there's like uh just digital copies oh okay because like they did when, when, when i looked i couldn't find it maybe they've changed that i hope so because i want to read would those suspect, directly yeah i would suspect that they are not like widely advertising those because they are yeah. a little bit crazy. Yeah. Wild. I, I wanted to ask you real quick. I know we finished up our questions, but I actually had two really quick ones, and hopefully they can just be yes or no answers. Um, sure. You had mentioned someone getting excommunicated from your church. In yes. um, orthodoxy, excommunication means just that you can't receive communion. Do Mormons do the Eucharist? Do they take the body and blood? So Mormons have what they call the sacrament, which is basically, yeah, they, they, do, they do bread and water. And, okay. and it's and it's basically <laughs> the same thing. Uh, and an excommunication, what excommunication means in Mormonism is that you're, so Mormonism, they care a lot about covenants, right? So you get baptized and that's a covenant. You go to the mm-hmm. temple, and make certain covenants and you have these ordinances and those ordinances are what save you. And so excommunication means that you are cast, you are basically, you're, you're cast out, out of the church and you are, all of those ordinances are canceled. Oh. It's, which is interesting to me because, like, excommunication, you can't have communion. So nah. they've just, they just they do whatever they want they, with they terms. Took, they took a word and they didn't yeah. care about what it meant. And then they used <laughs> Imagine. Fun. It was yeah. funny because Jessica tweeted before this I don't know if this is a coffee night or a beer night for the show. And I was like, it's a Mormon show. You can't have either. You can't have either of those. No. Yeah. And because I can't, I'm gonna, because that's how yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, the second question is, um, they, uh, AUB, that's mm-hmm. Apostolic United Brethren. Yes. Um, there's a church down the street from me and it calls itself an, the, the Apostolic Church of God. Is that related? To that's a, it. We're, yeah, we're, that's we're, a pure yeah. apostolic uh, Pentecostal. I'm in Georgia, like rural Georgia, like deep I south I almost Georgia. guarantee you it's not, it's not the same thing. Yeah. I would, gotcha. I would okay. bet it's Pentecostal. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because we drive yeah. by that and I'm like, I wonder who's in there. So maybe I mean, Mormons. Could, I don't know. You could knock oh. on the door and if there are a lot of women, then it could be. Okay. All right. One final question. Um, one of the things I heard the, just the other day is that the AUB essentially build the houses for the families like the sister wives and own oh. them. So essentially That's, you guys, so you guys would have rented it. Not exactly true. So in okay. in the AUB in, in Mormon polygamy, there's this doctrine that's called the United Order, and the 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 United Order is basically uh, it, it's it's like it comes from you know in the in the New Testament there's this line I think it says that the the followers of Christ have like everything in common and to yeah. each like so it's an attempt to live yeah. that way. It's this communal yeah. living, and often what happens is that they will form orders, so different kind of groups, and then 
they will sort of put everything into the order and then the order does own it. But there's but there's varying degrees of that, right? So okay. so right. it wouldn't ever be the whole AUB it would be like a, a community who's banded together and and they've donated basically whatever whatever is required by that community. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Cool. And so so and the the reason someone I someone said that was because apparently the house that the sister wives were in originally was then passed down to another family after they moved. I think that is true. Yeah. Okay. And that would be in line, right? That would be a, a, a pretty common thing that would happen because again, a lot of these communities, they don't want outsiders. Yes. That they makes don't sense. want people to move in who are, you know, j just someone who found it on Zillow. They yeah. don't want what me wandering in there with my beer and my <laughs> no. attitude problem. Right. I got no. you. No, you would be, you would be, you would corrupt them. Right. Yeah, I would. Yeah. <laughs> On purpose. Yeah. Look out for me. <laughs> so you have been an absolute joy to talk to. Your TikToks yes, very much. are a joy. Thank you. Um, I want I want to watch a movie with you sometime. I'm not yeah. going to invite myself to that, but I'm just telling let's, you, I want to it. at some yeah. point. I'm 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 down. I'll I'll uh, I'll reach out. It'd be it'd be fun. Um, but I, I, so thank you for coming on. I deeply appreciate, I've been, like I said, I've been looking forward to this for like two months Yeah. and I'm so happy that you're one of the great people that when I said, oh, we know we're booking out for April, you were like, yeah, I can figure that out. Like, that's, yeah. that's great. It's wonderful. Um, but I want to tell people where to find you. Um, I have a couple of things. Tell me if you want to add anything to this list, for sure. but I found you on TikTok at the fresh King Benjamin. Yep. That's where, where your, your videos are, which are, you're also a comedian. So it's they're they're funny. Yeah. So I'm I'm trying well. to paint a, a funny picture, and the best thing to do there is is there's a uh, there, you can sign up for an email list on on there. So if you go to Fresh King Benjamin, you can just click on there's like a little link, and you can click on there and you can fill out email, and that gets you on my email list, and that helps you know like when I'm gonna be, uh, you know, doing doing shows and stuff. And mm -hmm. I'm I'm starting to travel, right? So I'm gonna start popping into different places and doing shows here and there. Um, and so that's really a, a great place to just follow me. If you come to yeah. Florida, let me know. Atlanta, yeah. hit me up. I'll I show will. you a good time. Yeah, oh, it'll be super fun. I would. That'd be so rad. So part of what I'm part of the plan, right? What I want to do is I want to pop into a city and 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 meet people there and be like, hey, show me the cool thing to do. Like, introduce me to your city. Show me what's fun to do in Atlanta. Show me what's fun to do in Florida. Let's go have those experiences. Oh yeah. Take him to relapse. See, see, I'm not. You know, I, I, I'm going to take him to the dirt track race and winder. <laughs> <laughs> so rad. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah. um, I want I want to be able to experience the world through the lens of the people who love it, right? Show me for the, ten. Hey, what's cool about for your ten dollars, you're gonna get pit seats at a dirt track race, and you're probably gonna see a fist fight. It's like a requirement oh, of the dirt track race. So can I get it's involved pretty in the great. Fist fight? And then yes, and beers. And you will drink more beer than you've ever had in your entire life, like a regrettable <laughs> amount of beer. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds um, yeah. <laughs> be, beyond that, you do have an Instagram as well at the Fresh King Benjamin. I love that you cross platform naming is like the best thing. And when people don't do it, I get disappointed in them. Right. I used to be able to do it, but now since we're a, two hosts, stuff like that, you know, we have to differentiate. Wow. But I love it. Um, so Instagram at the Fresh King Benjamin. And I also found mm -hmm. stan.me slash the Fresh King Benjamin. Yep, I'd so never heard of this before. Yeah, so Stan, you this might actually be something that, that you guys might might uh, uh, enjoy as well. So Stan is just it's a creator store, so it, it, it allows you to um, to basically have a single link that can also be a storefront. And so the Stan with Me store that's linked on my TikTok, um, and it it basically allows people like if they I've got a uh, uh, an um, uh, like a short story style memoir, so it's like a it's a memoir, but it's like a shorter it's like twenty nine pages, it's just one story from my childhood. You can buy that. Um, I've got like an eight minute um, uh, uh, comedy set that you can download. It's like two dollars or something. And so if you want to actually buy content from me, that's that's where that's what that's for. Awesome. Is there anything awesome. else we should point people to? Uh, no, that's that's really it. So uh, thanks for uh, thanks for um, hosting me and thanks for uh, pitching my stuff. Absolutely. I, I like to do my homework. I like I like you not to have to say anything if you don't have to. Yeah, you crushed it. <laughs> <laughs> uh so thank you so much uh we will we'll let you go if you want to hang out and when i take you off the screen and talk anymore feel free to do that i'm just going to tell the the nerds that listen all the stuff they need to know for the future Sweet. So, i'm actually no because my computer's about to die and uh Sweet. 
I don't want to, I want to be able to say goodbye uh, effectively. So you guys, uh, Jessica, Cam, so lovely to connect with you and, and chat. Thank um, you. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thank and I'm going to have so to much. stitch or duet some of your, your TikTok sometimes. And that's like the, <laughs> the thing that I'm the worst at is yeah, TikTok. Do. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And you have a good night. Bye guys. You too. Bye. Bye. All right. For he the rest of fun. you. I liked him. Yeah, he was he was great. And not not only that is I, I got to talk about Mormonism as I have wanted to. Yeah. For so long. <laughs> I know. Like, you you want to back so hard on the Mormons and no one lets you. I'm sorry. Well, and it's not the people. <laughs> like like he said, and that's the thing. I'm always talking about Mormonism, but it's like, God, it's so weird. And it's like I those of you who may be listening to this who are Mormon, I love you. Know that. But some of that stuff's funny. No, so I'm gonna call my Mormon friends and be like, "Did you know this stuff they said about black people? Because y'all are black, and I don't know, I don't know what you do with that." <laughs> just the white some white and delight some is just the funniest thing. It's just they can't not know. <laughs> they they know, they know, they know. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. But you need to know what's coming up in the future. Uh, it's the end of the month, so you know what that means. That means Brad Binkley's back. We're going to wrap up the month. We're going to talk about what happened, what we missed throughout the news cycle. And we're also going to learn what's going on with the propaganda report because I don't know if you heard it. It was on their show. Monica's not going to be doing the Daily Show anymore. So we'll see what, what's going on with that. I know Brad's taking the reins. We'll, we'll see what his plans are. Hopefully he'll tell us. Uh, but beyond, after that, we have GW coming on months ago. Last year, I wanted to talk to a mortician about death. I wanted to get a real hands-on conversation about this. We did it, Jessica. We found mm -hmm. an embalmer slash autopsy technician. This was a Herculean effort, you guys, to fight. Because these people are busy getting their hands all up in the dead people. They don't have time for podcasting. Well, so. th th they're busy, and also most of them are older. And anyone mm -hmm. who's younger typically has, like, too large a platform to want to talk to me. Right. But GW said he'd come on. So we'll be talking to him about that after we talk to Brad. Then our buddy St Stephen Ignoramus is coming back on the show to talk about what happened on January 6th when he was there, what the FBI did to him and his sentencing. So I don't I haven't I haven't heard if he's let out all those details yet. He was he said he was going to do it sooner rather than than when he was supposed to come on. But I'm really hoping that it's not all out there before that. But We'll have a better conversation here anyway. So come, come join us for that. <laughs> um, and then after that, Cody Cook's coming back. He is very much a regular at this point. Yes. Um, and he's going to bring his, his buddy John D'Angelo on with him, who is the anti-war war vet. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie to you. I've been annoyed on Facebook and Twitter the way Christians have been talking about their enemies. And I want to talk about that. I want to talk about how we are called as Christians to love your enemies and enemy love. And so we're going to do that with Cody and John. And we're going to talk about how Cam is going to forgive Sean Austin. I'm t never. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond that, you know the normal stuff. Uh, Patreon.com slash the mad ones. You could have listened to this early, but you didn't. So, you know, come be here with us. Gosh, mm -hmm. um, I have a new shirt on. I got the I got the green tank. Very, so very jealous. handsome. Um, I also got the the green mug. And I got another tank that I'm going to wear next week, for which I'm not trying to wear black tanks. It's just our, our air conditioner is out right now. So I'm struggling to survive. I do feel like I could see your dirty pillows. And <laughs> I got to say. Oh, and Burt Kreischer. That's right. <laughs> he retweeted Cam about what a beautiful physique he has. Speaking because, of Cam's dirty pillows. Because I was watching Two Bears, One Cave, and I'd paused it, and my daughter uh, comes in, and she looks at it, and in the background, there's the image of both of them with bare heads over their heads, but they're shirtless, or he's shirtless, and she pointed to Burt Kreischer's chest and said, is that your booby? <laughs> and so I tweeted it, and, and Burt told me my body is beautiful, and... That's very, very great. But I'm not going to all tanks. But Brad's coming, so I have to wear tanks two, twice in a row. So just get used to seeing my arms. Um, so we are the madones.com slash store if you want to match us and be part of the tank club. 
Um, beyond that, I'm on on Twitter at Cam. Nope, that's not true. No, I'm you're at, not. I'm on Twitter at Ham Carlos. <sighs> still heartbroken over that. <laughs> and Jessica is still on Twitter at Soup Canarchist. If you want to join right. us there, um, if you're listening, you can watch every Wednesday 8:30 p.m. Eastern Time at youtube.com slash the mad ones. That's the best way to do it at this point because of the fact that I can bring comments onto the screen and we can we can have those those conversations. If you subscribe and if you you hit the like button, if you get us up to the thousand subscriber number and we get our watch numbers up, we can then do uh, super chats and I will we will make sure every super chat is answered live. Yes. And so help us get there because it's it's hard because you know sometimes it's just conversation in the chat if you want something said you know we got to get there we'll read your r-worded questions we will we'll read your r-worded we'll forced questions to. um if you want to watch it on a an alternative app because you don't like youtube we have rockfin and we have odyssey mm -hmm. where you can watch them both there if you'd rather listen we're on every podcatcher um yeah i think that's it that's it that's it. That's all we got. All right. Well, this was lovely. And I, I we since we had to do the staggering of dates because of Easter, I'm excited to get back into the weekly setup, the weekly mm -hmm. goings on. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited. Um, thank you for joining me, Jessica. Of course. And the rest of you, you beautiful, beautiful bastards. Um, you have a chance to be a light in the world. So go light it up. <laughs>